Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is celebrity chef and author Pete Evans. Pete is an internationally renowned chef, restaurateur, entrepreneur, keynote speaker, author, television presenter, and documentary producer. He has a podcast called Evolve with Pete Evans, exploring nutritional and emotional well-being. As Australia's number one selling author of healthy cooking and lifestyle books for the last five years, Pete is dedicated to educating people about nutritional food and wellness. With around 25 books to his name over the last 13 years, Pete is one of Australia's most published contemporary Australian chefs. He is also a health coach with qualifications gained from New York's internationally recognized Institute of Integrative Nutrition. His passion for food and a healthy lifestyle inspires individuals and families around the world. Hello, everybody. Have you ever wondered what happens when you become famous for helping people live better lives through cooking, organic food and farming, and producing documentaries that truly inform people of the deep truths of life, but then share your opinions about serious issues like vaccinations, political concerns, and what's going on in the world right now with the so-called pandemic? Well, if you've ever wondered just how far the corporate giants will go to not only squash, but discredit somebody using totally false propaganda, you're about to find out. Pete Evans is a world-famous chef, TV personality, author of 20 books on food and healing, a professional speaker, producer of multiple documentaries on food farming and the healing benefits of marijuana, and more. He has also traveled the world studying and filming shaman and their use of plant medicines for healing with Ben Stewart producer of Gaia TV's famous Psychedelica series, which is the best docu-series in the world on plant medicines, in my opinion. In this episode, Pete shares how he became a world-famous chef, what inspired him to write all the books and produce his documentaries, and the backlash from the corporate control mongers that he's experienced right up to very recently. If you have not woken up to the fact that right now, right under your nose, as you are distracted largely by propaganda, pawned off as truth in the media, we are losing our freedom of speech, our constitutional rights, and even our personal and, and bodily sovereignty. Hearing Pete's story should make what's going on crystal clear. Pete and I not only got into his evolutionary path to great success in his life, issues of food, food preparation, farming, and how to deal with the dragons when they come, we get into plant medicines and what they offer us if used skillfully. Enjoy learning a lot that can help you live and love more fully with Pete Evans. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a very interesting guest for you. His name is Pete Evans. He is a very famous chef. He has done all sorts of things. He's written a load of great books, produced multiple documentaries. And I met Pete through my student, who is an osteopath in Australia, named Helen Paderen who was a co-author of one of his books, which we'll talk about on the way. And then Pete and I made connection and have been interacting for, what, a few years now, Pete? It has been a few years now. A few beautiful years. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for all the great work you're doing out there. I mean, God, I was looking at your website and all the books and products and videos. I'm like, damn, this guy, he's as nutty as I am. You wonder when the hell he sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. I do sleep very That's, well. Yeah, well, you know, I, I can tell you've been very productive because you had a lot on there. I mean, I know how much it takes to write a book and make videos and all that. So when I looked at that, I go, well, there's a very busy guy who's got a lot of spirit moving through him for sure. I mean, I already knew you were a you know, busy, productive guy, but I hadn't looked at your website before. And when I did, I'm I went, wow, <laughs> Pete's done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned long ago that I, I believe our purpose in life is to express ourselves creatively in whatever form Amen. that means for each and every one of us. And it doesn't necessarily mean we need to be busy and produce things publicly. It just means that we express ourselves creatively. And for me, I've been on a wonderful journey where I've, uh, I, I think I've had one of the most beautiful journeys because I've learned how to cook, which I think is one of the greatest life skills that we can have Amen. To, to nourish ourselves. It's, I, I see it now as a gift of self-love. And when you can look at that art form 
of being able to provide yourself with a form of self-love and self-nourishment, but also to expand that out to your family and to your friends. And as I said, I've been given a wonderful opportunity where I get to share that to a larger audience through my training and through some of these wild twists and turns in life, which has given me the, I guess, the identity one of my identities as a celebrity chef where I've been fortunate enough to share these recipes through a, a medium such as television and cookbooks and uh, films and podcasts and and so on where we get to reach a, a, a really wide audience with this beautiful gift of how to look after ourselves using food. And you know, I'm so grateful for that experience and I, I've never taken it for granted. Well, I think I used to, and now I've, I've, I, now I see it for what it is, and it's a, it's just a wonderful tool of of expression, of of the highest frequency. It is, and you know, looking at your products, they're they're all things that are gifts to the world. You know, they're not uh, ego statements; they're real, you know, offerings that help people live and heal and nourish and connect, and you know. There's a there's a whole great chain of being happening in those things, and I can tell from working with you in the past few years that you're not only doing these things, but you're often traveling all over the world and gathering, you know, insights and knowledge from other cultures, which is also very beautiful. Yeah, I, I've I've taken on the role of the eternal student. <laughs> and yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I, and it, I learned that from you too. the right word. <laughs> and I, it's one of my greatest passions is to be able to put myself into a position of the beginner mind. And even this morning, I, I went to yoga with my wife, and I have to say that I am the beginner of the beginners in yoga. Uh, I looked around the class, and I am definitely, and I don't like to compare myself, but I, you know, f- quite frankly, I was the worst. Uh, student in yoga today as far as what I could achieve but I was I'm equally grateful for that because I can see such a a a huge journey ahead for me as a 47 year old man who has started a journey of yoga and I'm excited about that and it's it's very humbling (laughs) to know that you're the worst person in the class but that excites me as well it's like here we go this is this is exciting. This is humbling. This is frustrating. This is this is challenging. This is you know those small little increments that I that I witnessed today in the class. You know where I could really be in the moment and feel all of those feelings rushing through me. <laughs> this is amazing. You know this is amazing because those feelings did come up. You're useless. You're not great. You're you're inflexible. You'll never achieve greatness in this. But at the same time, it's like, wow! Thank you for going on this journey. Thank you for putting yourself into this situation. Thank you for for being so vulnerable again in this experience and not being the expert in something. Because in cooking, I would say that I've become what I would call somewhat of an expert in that field. And it's very easy to rely and to settle back into the ego, into what you're good at. But the growth comes from going into things that you're not great at. (laughs) Yeah, well, I get that every day with two kids and two wives. There's always some new surprise waiting for you around the corner, whether it be um, a milkshake dumped into your console in your car or a you never know. So it's just like, uh, I think life just keeps serving us up growth opportunities. And I think once we start accepting them and engaging them, then spirit says, oh, okay, you're getting the message. We'll slow down a little bit. <laughs> mm, and and uh, it was beautiful because two nights ago, we have we filmed together earlier this year. It was later last year, uh, the end part of last year or early this year. I can't remember exactly. And we had an hour and a half interview and then you finished off by doing your um, rock building. And I don't know the exact terminology for it, but- uh, Uh, Rock rock stacking. (laughs) Rock stacking. And I was watching that two nights ago and 
we, my wife and I have just purchased some prop- a property to do a, a wellness retreat and a cooking retreat. And I have been meaning to start that practice of the rock stacking. And when I was watching you and ex- watching you do that again through the medium of, of film and listening to your words, I'm, I'm, I could see myself in a matter of months starting on that journey again of being a beginner. And I'm so excited about that again because, as you said, you, you, if you're not present in the moment when you're doing that, it will bring you in, in, into the present moment through, through pain or through distraction or whatever it may be. And I'm yeah. excited for that. So, th- so thank you for allowing me to and my team to film you do that and to understand the next, one of the next parts of my journey. Yeah, you know, the stone Buddhas are brutally honest teachers and uh, they work with this thing called gravity, which is uh, apparently a weak force in physics, but a very strong force when it's rocks falling toward your head (laughs) or your feet (laughs) or your hands. So the secret is stay alert and stay alive and never rush in a rock garden. Mm, I love it. And since the whole world is a rock garden, those things apply everywhere and it takes us a while to figure it out but you know i think we're both far enough along the path now we know how to breathe and instead of uh losing it hold still and witness it and say okay what's the best thing i can do right now to make things better instead of worse (laughs) Mm, beautiful words you know Your life has been very rich and diverse. As we've discussed, you're a world-famous chef, TV personality. I counted 20 books on your website, which is just a lot. I've written 11 myself, so I know how much work that is. Uh, You're a professional speaker, a producer of multiple documentaries. Um, What are some of the names of the TV shows you've hosted in the name of some of your key books and documentaries, just so the listeners can maybe get a sense of whether they've come across any of the things you've produced. For sure. Thanks for the question. And I learned quite a few years ago, I met a very fascinating man called Peter Melov in Australia and a very free thinker. And one thing that I learned from him was to offer solutions. There's no point whinging about something or getting upset and being angry about things without offering a solution. And Many, many years ago when I came across the paleo diet and the ketogenic diet is about a decade ago and my wife introduced me to this and I'm very forever grateful for her. She seems to be a, a catalyst for, for many things in my life and I'm loving our relationship in that realm because she brings in ideas and then I go off and uh, turn them into something as a solution for a large audience. And we've met at the right time on our journeys and and that relationship, that's just one part of the relationship that I can look back now and see that she is this catalyst for me and, you know, she, she is a fire dragon and I'm the ox and I'm the, I'm, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful union. But going back to Pete Mellov, he always said, we have to offer solutions. And I guess going back to the first documentary we made about four or five years ago, it was called The Magic Pill. And at the time, after about four or five years of understanding the power of food as one of our tools for healing and for self-nourishment and self-love, I was looking out at the at the solution-based ideas out there, and I'd released quite a few cookbooks on the on the premise of this, and a lot of people had improved their health in in ways that. At the start, it seemed miraculous, but after I had shared the 2,000 or 3,000 story of of these people through my social media of everything from anxiety, depression, uh, reversing type 2 diabetes, putting their autoimmune disease in remission, cancer, uh, autism, all of these wonderful stories from all walks and ages of, of life. I was looking at another medium, which is the the film medium, and I was looking for a documentary that 
was the solution that I was looking for, that we were presenting in our books, and I couldn't find one. So I said, well, this is an opportunity to offer a solution because a lot of people may not read a book, but they will watch a 60-minute or 90-minute documentary. So all of a sudden that came through spirit as like you're going to make it. And I was shit scared, to be honest with you. I was like, okay, well, how do I make a film about such a, a, a powerful topic of food as medicine? And I went on this journey and lo and behold, after two years, we traveled the world. We interviewed some wonderful people, uh, including the ind indigenous or the tribal people of Australia. And we packaged that up into a 90 minute documentary called The Magic Pill. And I had no idea where it was going to be shown, how it was going to be released. And again, I just trusted that the people that needed to see it will get to see it. And we released it through iTunes to start with. And then Netflix wanted to release it. And that was a, a beautiful experience to have such a, uh, I guess, a powerhouse of entertainment release a documentary. And they took it on globally. I think it was released in every territory in the world except for, I believe, North Korea and Iran. And it was subtitled or dubbed into all of the different languages. And that ran for two years exclusively. And I'll never forget the day that the president of the Australian Medical Association came out with a tweet saying that he would he demands the film to be pulled off Netflix because it was dangerous and misleading to the public. And I was like, ooh, this is interesting. Somebody is somebody's somebody's um feeling very threatened here. Some Somebody sees a lot of money getting lost by people getting healthy. So I simply responded. I said, How, if the president of the Australian Medical Association can, can prove that organic meat and seafood and wild-caught seafood, organic meat, pasture-raised meat, organic vegetables and fruit and nuts and seeds and, and eggs are dangerous for a human being, show us the evidence. Show us the evidence. And all you heard was crickets, you know, because it's impossible for them to show any evidence that, you know, a uh, basically a hunter gatherer diet or a ketogenic diet. Uh, based the evidence off those principles. is the, the evidence that it works is that we're all here. That's how we evolved. It's it's what they're doing that's causing the problem, not what nature does. Mm -hmm. So that was a fascinating journey, and then. Uh, about a year or two ago, probably two years ago after, it was actually three years ago, after I had the wonderful for fortunate experience to smoke toad medicine or 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, uh, oh, I love it. What came through in that experience or what came through me as I re-entered into the Pete Evans physical form, <laughs> in that, back into this reality, this dream. Well, this illusion was you're going to make a film about psychedelics. And it was just this knowing again, this channeling. I was like, okay, if that's what I'm meant to do, that's what I'm meant to do. And I think that's where we ended up um, having a conversation. And it was so funny because for six months we went into pre-production and where we were going to film and we were going to document ayahuasca, cactus medicine, psilocybin, toad medicine. And... Uh, LSD and ketamine and all of these things. And I ha met a wonderful, wonderful human being called Ben Stewart, who is a, a mutual friend who you've had on your podcast before. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Because I was like, how the hell am I going to make a film about psychedelics? Because then I started watching everything I could about psychedelics. And again, it, it, some parts resonated with me, other parts didn't. I was like, okay, well, here's another opportunity to offer a solution about the science behind psychedelics and the and the ancient wisdom and the and the modern science that um, is being studied at the moment, and it was so fascinating. About a month before we were about to travel overseas to start this, cannabis knocked on my door, and it said, "Hey, Pete, you're actually meant to make a film about cannabis before you go on to do the other psychedelic experiences," and. I was like, okay, well, this is interesting. So I rang up Ben a month out from filming the psychedelic film. I said, Ben, 
something has just come through me through my spirit through channeling that we should just make a, a whole film about cannabis because going from food as medicine into psychedelics as another form of medicine might be too much of a leap and perhaps cannabis or knowingly cannabis sort of straddles psychedelic because it is a psychedelic but it also is a food and maybe that's the next best step for you instead of taking that that huge leap so I trusted in in spirit again, and because Ben is open to spirit and understanding when something comes along to to go with it, he said, "Not a problem." So we quickly worked out how we could create a film about cannabis, and we titled it "The Magic Plant," and we went on our merry adventure for a year, filming everything we could about cannabis, filming the growers, filming uh, the the OGs of of the of the industry that were growing it through prohibition. We filmed with the the new cartels, so to speak, the modern medical <laughs> uh, gangsters that um, have taken over a big chunk of the market. We filmed with the doctors that have been promoting this for decades, and we filmed with uh, the regenerative farmers. And we filmed with the patients and we filmed with the futurists as well that talked about how cannabis, where it's going in the future. And at the same time, we also filmed with the, the spiritual ideology and philosophy of cannabis and also the, the history of cannabis. And it was such a beautiful journey for myself because, again, I was a beginner or a novice of understanding cannabis. And what we managed to do, and I'm very grateful for it, is again package up something that's in a 90-minute format called The Magic Plant, and we've just launched it a couple of months ago on our own platform called EvolveNetwork.tv. If you listen to my podcast with any regularity, you've now heard of a number of cases I've been involved in that were serious. Surely you've also come to realize that there's no replacement for organically and biodynamically grown foods if you want to be healthy and make sure your food and drink dollars are going to companies that are supporting the ecosystem of our planet. I realize many of you live busy lives and probably have little time to hunt down organic farms and farmers markets, but it doesn't have to be hard to consume real organic foods and drinks. If you'd like to add real certified organic foods and drinks to your diet that is easy to use, fast and nutritious, there's no better place to start than Organifi. Organifi offers a wide variety of excellent, good-tasting, easy-to-prepare superfoods, protein powders, and drinks that my family, friends, and clients use regularly and love. You can taste and feel the nutrition right away, and I know you're going to love Organifi's great products. Go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and on checkout, use the code, all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20, to get your 20% discount on any purchase. To get to know Drew Canoli, the founder of Organifi, listen to my podcast episode 64, Drew Canoli, UBU. Enjoy Organifi. When... I went to Costa Rica last year and sat with grandmother or ayahuasca. In that experience, it said, actually, Pete, you, you will never probably make a film about psychedelics. What you're going to do is make episodes or episodic documentary, uh, docu-series about the different psychedelics. You don't need to package this into a whole film anymore. You're just going to go and, and when the time is right, you'll, you'll film the experience and I like to be the experiential journalist, so to speak, put myself into that position like I did with food, like I did with cannabis, and now I am have been doing with psychedelics and other forms of uh, conscious expanding modalities. And that's where I'm at at the moment is filming these episodes and releasing them whenever they feel like they need to come out into the platform of modern media. So it's been a... A, a wonderful journey so far, Paul, and I, I, I'm grateful for our connection because you've played a, a pivotal role in this for me as well. Well, thanks. Anything I can do to help is always beautiful. Um, I love to share. And um, uh, I was curious, is this linked to the new Psychedelica 2 coming out on Gaia TV? It's actually not. Um, I'm not actually up, up to date with uh, where Ben's at with Psychedelica 2, but he is... 
definitely a, um, a beautiful human being. And what I loved about working with Ben and why I was attracted to Ben was, for anybody listening, uh, Ben was the creator and director of Psychedelica, which is a 14-part series on Gaia. And his tone and his the way that he approached psychedelics and entheogen or entheogenic medicine was it really resonated with me because he he attempted and he did it with great success to show the good the bad the ugly the beautiful <laughs> all aspects of it instead of just glorifying psychedelics and that's what I really wanted to show. So Ben and I worked on the magic plant, which was about cannabis, and I wanted the same, the same feeling there that I don't want to glorify or we shouldn't glorify something because everything can be used as a tool, as you know, for abuse, self-abuse. Uh, it can be used as a, as a, as a way escape. to suppress it. Escape. And I really wanted to do that. And I, I, when we made the magic plant, um, I mean, when we made the magic pill, our first documentary, I made a, um, a prerequisite that we start off the film and just say that food is one of the tools that we use because I've seen it. I've seen it so many times where people hang their hats on one form of medicine, whether it be diet, whether it be psychedelics or cannabis, whether it be just breath work, whether it be a spiritual philosophy or ideology. And I, I personally believe we have to be open to all that they're just tools. And some, somewhere along on our journey, we might come into a, a realization where we need to adapt and that's something that was good for us at that particular t point in time. We need to adapt out of that. And I'd love to hear your understanding of that too, because I'm sure you have been down so many rabbit holes where, you, where you've like, okay, that doesn't serve me anymore. Well, absolutely. Um, and, you know, this is sort of at the core of my philosophy on diet and that's why I tell people there is no such thing as the right diet for any mass of people or even any two people. And I show people for, I teach my students, I, I show them techniques from soul connection to muscle testing to logging symptoms. And I say, okay, you pay close attention to what your body's actually telling you, what your emotions are telling you, what your mind is telling you, what your energy levels are telling you what your skin's telling you, your urine, your feces, your breath, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you'll see people, for example, say, oh, keto is just the most amazing thing since sliced bread, blah, blah, blah. And I say, yes, it is right now. But pay a close attention to what I'm teaching you. And when your body has the nutrients that it needs from that diet, it all of a sudden will start producing negative symptoms just like when you're tired, coffee seems to be a magical drug. But when it stops you from sleeping and you start noticing you're going from one cup to two cups to three cups, and then you get to the point where the cup of coffee that used to give you the energy and mental clarity is all of a sudden now not only giving you headaches, but it's making you even more tired and causing your cognition to be fuzzy and confused and drying your body out and for women screwing their menstrual cycle up, that's when your body is no longer benefiting from it, but it's actually being harmed by it. You know, it, it's the same with everything. It's sex, right? Most of us <laughs> intelligent, healthy males have had the opportunity to, and, and beautiful females have had the opportunity to engage sex. And we can get so passionate and so in love with the physical act and the connection and the euphoria and the orgasm that we can get to the point where it just feels like we're masturbating with someone's body and the, and the depth of the heart connection is gone, that we've habituated ourselves to this constant stimulation like a rat that just keeps pressing the lever and getting sugar until it's dead. 
because we're a living system and we are permeable to the environment, we have to also be aware that as the environment changes, what we need physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually changes. We can, for example, be feeling all alone and maybe have spent a year or two single and feel very kind of stuck in our life and, and start dreaming about a partner. And next thing you know, we've got a partner, then we've got a couple of kids and we can barely find time to wipe our backside. We're racing like hell to meet deadlines to try to make a living. And we fantasize about the days when we had time to meditate and look back and realize how amazing and how beautiful it was when we had all this quiet time but realize that we never really enjoyed it because we kept looking for something else. And so when you realize that what we think of as our soul is made of a myriad of other souls, not to mention the ones in our gene lines, but all the souls that we interact with in the afterlife that inspire us to come back and create more beauty in the world and grow, then we realize that we are constantly in a state of dynamic equilibrium in which sometimes we need solitude, sometimes we need friends, sometimes we need partnership, sometimes we need a man cave or a woman needs to go get her nails done and have her face done and just have an hour or two or an afternoon at the spa or a day spa just to have the grace of being alone and doing something for herself. Sometimes people get into things like cocaine and various party drugs, and it adds a lot of levity and value. But the next thing you know, they realize that they're living with cocaine and, and stimulants all the time, and they've forgotten what it's like to be on the ground. Mm, so I was, I was I think- offered that actually on the weekend. <laughs> so I, was, I was at a party and... and- I had was with some friends and that I hadn't seen for a decade, and it was offered to me. I was like, "Hmm." I said, "I don't, I don't do that anymore." <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was a time where I used to do a lot of it, and it was a really in- interesting invitation because everybody was on it. I was like, "You know what? I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll stick with my water today." <laughs> and uh, but it was it was beautiful to witness that and see how that resonated for me. Yeah, that's called growing up. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the thing too is just that um, my personal policy is to avoid things that are addictive. I define an addiction as any repeated behavior that does not produce the results you want. And because like you, I'm very driven by my passion and I have a very strong sense of soul purpose and mission in life, I've always really had this deep sort of inner compass that when people would offer me cocaine or various other drugs, that because of all the problems I saw and all my friends doing them, I just had this internal sense that that is actually a major distraction based on what I've learned from watching other people do it. And so I've always oriented myself toward the plant medicines that are healing create higher consciousness, help you heal the shadow, expand your capacity for inner vision and spiritual growth, but aren't addictive. And fortunately, psychedelic drugs as a class of drugs are not chemically addictive. They can be psychologically addictive to people, but they're not chemically addictive addictive like cocaine or morphine or heroin or coffee or other drugs like that. So I think that You know, there's, I think when we look at life as a smorgasbord, if we do nothing but eat turkey, pretty soon our body starts feeling turkeyed to death and (laughs) is begging for salad. And if we don't eat the salad, then we end up going to someone and spending a lot of money wondering why we can't poop and we feel crappy all the time without realizing that we've eaten 362 turkeys in a row. And I think it's really just a matter of, of 
personally, my observation is that one of the big challenges we have is our, our psyches are so externalized, especially in the Western world, in the industrial world, and now in the information age, people are identifying themselves perpetually by what's happening outside or what they're making happen outside or how people are responding, whether they're getting enough likes or hearts or hugs or whatever on social media. But at the end of the day, we we forget that who we really are is on the inside. And if we don't spend time inside getting to know what our real needs are and developing a relationship with our body and our our liver and our kidneys and our stomach and our heart and our lungs, then ultimately we end up waiting for the pain teacher to come poke us with a very sharp knife and give us a great reason to look inside. And sadly, sometimes it takes people eight or 10 visits to the operating table to finally wake up to the fact that they wouldn't have to be there at all if they would have just stopped eating them damn turkeys <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find it fascinating being in this position, and I'm sure you have, you do too, is um, as I go back to that terminology, being a celebrity chef, and, and once upon a time, the books that I used to write as cookbooks were just delicious food, you know, without paying any attention really to how it would affect the body, mind, or spirit. Whereas the last 10 years, I've written maybe 20 books and I've had the good pleasure of writing three with Dr. McCola and a few with Helen Patteron, who's, who you mentioned before. And being able to really think about how the foods will affect our body, mind, and spirit is a huge, I, I feel like it's a huge responsibility. And it 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 adds adds weight because Going back to one of the, my earlier mentions is that I'm an eternal student, but then when you put yourself into a position of a teacher in whatever realm that may be, it, it, it becomes so much more. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, this could actually impact people's lives now because you actually are putting yourself into that position where people will listen to you and then they may just take on everything that you've that you're saying but without actually reading everything that you've said <laughs> you know you talk about how many books you've you've written and how much information goes into it and i can't tell you i mean my books are a little different because 80% of them are recipes but at the front section of the book there's information like from dr McCola or helen patteron or other experts that i bring in to help uh, educate people. But the amount of people that would not read the front section is is quite scary because in that sometimes is the, or a lot of the time, is the wisdom that helps uh, guide people to help them understand. Hi, everybody. I know that you're all aware of the importance of vitamin C. There is a mountain of research on it, but not all C is created equally. I love Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex because it is the real deal, bioavailable. And I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith, founder of Paleo Valley, why their Essential C Complex is so unique and something you definitely want for your family and your children. Autumn, tell us about your Essential C Complex. Well, I was shocked to learn as a holistic nutritionist that 90%, over 90% of the vitamin C on the market is derived from genetically modified corn and then it's processed with highly volatile acids. And so I knew I had to find a better way to get all of the powerful benefits of vitamin C. So what I did was I dove into the research and I found the three most vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet. That's unripe acerola cherry and camu camu and amla berry. And then I just packed them into capsules. And the benefits are amazing because you're not only getting vitamin C, but all of the other wonderful benefits that come from these amazing superfoods. So to get access to this complex, all you have to do is go to paleovalley.com and you can use the code CHECK15 at checkout. That's lowercase C-H-E-K 15 and you can save 15% off. I'll never forget it. Last year I was um, having, I was at this stretch studio, funnily enough, and one of the therapists that was stretching me said, this keto thing isn't working for me. 
I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, it was a female. And she says, well, I'm eating 17 and a half grams, which was, I guess would be half an ounce of carbs per day. And I said, well, where did you get that information from? She goes, from my personal trainer. I said, why did they tell you you can only eat 17 and a half grams of carbs per day? She goes, because that's what a ketogenic diet means. <laughs> I, said, well, I said, you might want to do a little bit more research into what the actual philosophy behind this actually entails. And she looked at me as if I was speaking in another language. And I said, you know, here's some here's some other information that might take you on a, on to expand your knowledge base about what ketogenic means and maybe cyclical ketogenic, maybe seasonal ketogenic, what it means for a woman to do a ketogenic diet that you don't do it 100% of the time. And it was it was frightening for me that there's so many people out there that f- that f- that just go off on a journey but not having the whole picture and she was in a lot of pain like she was causing her body damage doing something that she thought was the hip new thing and yes very much like vegans and vegetarians do in mass mhm and and with that i guess going back to it it becomes a a strange situation to be a student and teacher at the same time because the repercussions can be can be quite devastating for people if they just trust parts of what you share and and I'd love to hear from you about your your experience because you train the trainers of the world and how do you go about that because you must have some amazing stories to share about how people maybe misinterpret what you're sharing. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean it's a a long long list and uh like you said people they're inevitably want to take shortcuts and do the things that are just kind of human nature to uh try to uh, get to the gold without smelting the ore so to speak, but uh you know, I've just had so many experiences, but I always tell my students, don't believe a word I say. <laughs> I say that Practice too. it. Yeah, I tell them, practice it. If if you do it and it doesn't work, then come back and talk to me. And so far in my entire career, I started the Institute in 1995. Every single student, regardless of their degrees or education that came back and said something I taught them wasn't working, when I asked them to demonstrate it for me, they, every one of them was doing it wrong. And when they learned to do it right, then it worked. What I did want to highlight is you, you were talking about, you know, the kind of the power and the importance of being a teacher. And what I teach my students is that love comes with responsibility and the responsibility goes up in proportion to the nature of the love. And the model that I teach is I, we all. Loving yourself means you're responsible for what you create in the relationship with yourself. Loving somebody else means you're 50% responsible for the relationship and you're 100% responsible for your 50%. So if you're not present in the relationship, if 10% of you is somewhere else daydreaming while your partner's trying to get an important point across to you or share something that she really needs you to feel or hear, or maybe it's a he listening or a she listening either way, then there's 10% of you that's gone and that you're not accessing. And there's 10% of you that she can't or they can't access, which creates a 20% deficit. And I say, if you want to know how big a 20% deficit is, just ask the next pilot that you meet, what happens if you're 20% off in your (laughs) compass bearings as to where you're flying that airplane? And you'll see why so many relationships are in trouble. But when you get to the all level, that means there's three or more people. So when a couple have a child, they now are promoted to the all level of spiritual responsibility. So in my model, once you hit three people or more, you are tasked with the responsibility of being authentic and doing the work to make sure that what you're presenting is really the best thing that you can present 
and that you've done the work to make sure it's as safe and as effective as possible. Because if you take shortcuts or you mislead people or you're just trying to, you know, masquerade as a teacher and charge people lots of money, then you have to deal with this neat little thing called karma. And I tell my students, love is a boomerang. Whatever you put out comes back to you. Rudolf Steiner says, if you make a mistake in the world or you harm somebody or something, like another being, another animal, but you did it out of honest ignorance, the universe will always absorb the karma for you. For example, when I was a young man, I had no idea that being a faller in a logging camp and clear-cutting forests was nearly as bad of a thing as I realize now. And when I was 18 and 19, I was just so proud of myself that I worked my way from the bottom to the top of a logging camp in a short period of time. I was making $250 a day as a paid faller, and it took most men 25 to 30 years to achieve what I'd done in about just under two years. And so I look at that now with sadness, but because I was completely ignorant of what I was really doing and I was just doing my best to feed my family, the universe will absorb that karma for me. But if I'd have been an environmentalist and I'd been educated and I had the knowledge I had now and I started clear cutting trees, then I would have to take the karma for each of the deaths that I created not only of the tree, but every living creature in it. My point is, is that many people are unaware that when you teach, whatever you teach that person not only influences their lives, but could influence a myriad of lives. For example, right now, my students have probably written something along the lines of 40 plus books many of which are just filled with teachings from me and my institute. So if I wasn't doing my due diligence as a teacher to honor and take ownership of my responsibility at the all level of spiritual responsibility, I could have 40 other books misleading people out there, and that can generate quite a karmic backlash along the way. And so... The beauty of that is, is that a lot of the scams that are going on in the world, because they're not true and because they're manufactured manipulation, are definitely going to produce a backlash. And as the old saying goes, the cream always rises to the top, which means you can never repress the truth. The, the, the universe has a writing mechanism built into it. It's within spirit. So it's just a matter of time before... Uh, the forces of manipulation are leveled by the forces of truth. And it's the same with, you know, as you know, some, a lot of the challenges you're going through, what we'll get into here in a little bit, but I've been through an endless stream of attacks from the medical community and doctors and therapists and you name it. But I, I've also got enough depth of knowledge to know when those attacks are not based on knowledge or based on personal biases and insecurities because if they were based on knowledge, I'd be the first one to great, give them a great big hug or a handshake. If they thank you for your criticism, you've just helped me a lot. And I would make changes accordingly. But Pete, I'm curious if you could, because you've done so much, how old you said 47? I am 47, yeah. Yeah, so you've been on the planet for a while. Could you just give us a little bit of a, a biographical overview of, of how... Pete grew into this wildly interesting chef, author, movie producer, entrepreneurial <laughs> type man that has influenced so many people around the world, including me. Oh, thank you, Paul. Yeah, the story is pretty, pretty simple, actually. I, I parents separated when I was quite young, I was a three-year-old, and I grew up with my mother. And I had an older brother and sister that I didn't really grow up with. They were nine and 12 years older themselves from me. And so I sort of grew up as an only child. So I spent a lot of time by myself and I'm very comfortable being by myself. And I was probably, I'd laugh about this now, but I was the shyest kid at school. 
I was petrified of being seen or heard, and I think that came back through from my childhood. Um, really deeply, it affected me that little children should be seen and not heard, but I think I took it to, to the extreme, whereas children shouldn't, shouldn't be seen and shouldn't be heard. You know, I remember my grandparents or family saying that, and I think it can really it can be very damaging to a child when they hear these things at such a young age, you know, even though the parents might be joking or the grandparents could be joking. And, and I still witness it. I see, still see and observe parents and other people saying the most horrible things about their children and in a joking way. And it's, it's, it's like, whoa. But um, I ended up becoming a chef at the age of 17 after working in the food industry from the age of 13. Part-time, I worked in, believe it or not, McDonald's and Sizzler, fast food restaurants, and worked my, worked my way up from the age of 13 onwards. And I ended up becoming a chef, doing an apprenticeship, and then going into business with my brother and my father, that I didn't really have a, have a, a deep relationship before that. And that happened around the age of 19. And, and through that experience, I had to learn to take responsibility because I ended up becoming a head chef by the age of 19. And when anybody that's listening that uh, is a chef or a doctor or that has worked many hours, my average working week was about 80 hours. And then when we opened our first restaurant, when I was 19, my working weeks went up to 100 hour weeks in the kitchen and that taught you're lucky you didn't fall asleep and cut your fingers off <laughs> well i'm really really grateful for that experience because it taught me how much i can handle the physical body and the the emotional stress and the exhaustion like i pushed myself to the point of exhaustion um in ways that i never believed i was capable of and it was a very you know, looking back, I mean, it was crazy, but I'm very grateful for it because it, it taught me to be very, very thick skinned and it taught me to have self reliance in ways I never thought possible. And throughout that experience of being a chef, I, my, my brain was really good at copying and pasting, so to speak. So I could look at a recipe and learn a recipe and be able to execute it equally as good, if not better than than the original. But one of my greatest fears along this path was my own creative ability. So at about the age of 22, 23, I started to really push myself into the realm of creative expression in the kitchen. And it, 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 it was frightening for me. And it, it might sound crazy for people to hear that, but creating something new that hadn't been seen or tasted before was a real challenge for me. And I did that for many, many years until I got comfortable with that to the point was like, okay, I've pushed myself into an area where I was a beginner and fearful. And now I've come out the other side as I would say uh, experienced in that. So I, so I no longer had fear in that realm. After that, I was offered a job on television. And I have to tell you that I was still fearful of being seen and heard in that realm. And I turned it down, and then a week later, I was offered the same opportunity to audition for a, a new cooking show. And it was right at the time where Jamie Oliver, the United uh, the United Kingdom chef, had sprung to uh, had made fame fame made cooking cool. And I realised at that point in time that the universe was offering me a new adventure. And again. I took on the, the challenge of that sort of very reluctantly, but I also knew, I knew as soon as I went into that audition that my life was going to change. And lo and behold, I got the job. And it took me about six years until I overcame or overcame that fear of public speaking or being on camera. And you know, they always say the two greatest fears in life is death and public speaking. And I have to agree that that was a real challenge for me. And I overcome that fear to the point now where 
I don't really it, it for the last 10 years it hasn't registered as a fear for me or or even being uncomfortable so I'm happy thank to, God we, we need you <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was it was it was challenging I have to say it was really really challenging but this has been my life's purpose is to confront my fears and then lo and behold uh, psychedelics appeared a little later on and I went through the other great fear which is fear of death and I've been yeah baby and I've been through that fear, fear of fear of fully engaging yourself <laughs> uh-huh and I've been through that process many times and I can't say it's easy but it's uh, very liberating once you get to experience your own death in that reality or that realm over and over and even a, a, a recent cactus journey a couple of years ago I had 18 hours of what I would call the deepest darkest fears that I could ever summon uh, going from one one loop of fear into a deeper and darker one then into a deeper and darker spiral for those 18 hours and that I'm very grateful for that and that experience was what I set my intention for was to have greater compassion for my fellow human beings and for myself and what that taught me was no matter how dark or how how heavy it gets out there in the world or in the internal world that there is always light and there is always that inner strength that we can rely upon to pick us up and that broke me <laughs> it, it 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 attempted to break me and it did break my 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 mind and my spirit over and over and over until the point where i could pick myself up and find that 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 millimeter or that inch in which to move forward out of that experience and i am grateful for it because over the last year i've seemed to have been thrust into the spotlight again in in ways in which i think a lot of people may not be able to deal with uh public persecution and now i can look at it and and <laughs> and I go is that all you've got <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> media scrutiny public scrutiny whatever it may be is it's like i, I my my analogy of it is it's like a, a little fly buzzing around my head after the experiences that i've been able to put myself into and come through that this is just um there's no fear left for me in this experience of this reality. And it seems like they're, they're trying to pile it on at the moment. And it's like, okay, you're going to do, have to do a lot more than that to, to destabil, destabilize me. And I, don't think, I, don't, I don't, do not think that there could be any destabilization anymore. No, and I've been through so much of that myself. You know, Bioptimizers makes an amazing product called P3OM, which is a prebiotic product. And it's amazing for uh, not only helping uh, repopulate the gut with uh, friendly bacteria, but as Wade will tell you, it's really, really an amazing uh, product in case you ever feel like you're getting any kind of food poisoning or illness coming on. And Wade's right here with me, and he's the co-founder of Bioptimizers, and he knows more about P3OM than anybody. But I can tell you this, I've had nothing but excellent results and nothing but positive feedback from all my clients and friends that I've turned, it on, turned on to P3OM. So Wade, tell us a little bit about P3OM and, and why it works so well. Well, P3OM is, we call it the Navy SEAL of probiotics. Amen. Bas basically, its job is to kick out the bad guys in your body. Uh, food poisoning is one of those things from bad bacteria. What we've done is we've taken a, an aggressive strain of L-plantarum. We put it into toxic soup, ran a sine wave to keep a few of them alive. And the few survivors, we grow on very specialized medium to make a cultured, patented enzyme that has extraordinary powers. Uh, number one, it survives the intestinal tract. Yes. And number two, it is absolutely hunts down uh, pathogens in, this, in the body, bacteria, viruses, these type of things. And 
This is really where the future of probiotics is. It is about developing and culturing and creating super strains of probiotic. Very much like the Navy SEALs go through a training and these yes. individuals mm -hmm. have extraordinary powers to deal with chaos. And in today's world where we want to improve our immunity and our function and our gut health, P through M is head and shoulders above any probiotic out there. So my understanding is it can be used daily as a supplement, but it can also be used in larger quantities as a defense measure. We've tested this uh, literally with over a hundred of our friends who have been suffering from various times of food poisoning. And a handful of those guys, when you're in food poisoning and within 20 to 30 minutes, you complete recovery. That's awesome. And I've, I've uh, seen it happen myself. Angie has felt bad a number of times and uh, several of people in the, in the house or family have. And I say, take 10 if that doesn't feel good in an hour, take 20. And you've told me you can't overdose on them, which is amazing. Yeah, that's the beauty of P3M. You can't take too much. They'll fight off the bad guys and uh, they'll get your digestion rocking and rolling the way it should. So if you want to have a healthy gut and you want some defense, carry P3OM with you wherever you go, airplanes, cars, business meetings, hotels, conferences, and you've got your Navy SEALs in the bottle and they're ready for you anytime. Wade, how do we, we get a hold of your amazing P3OM product? Super easy. Just go to www.bioptimizers.com slash living4d and put in Paul10 for your 10% discount code. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com slash living4d and Paul10 for your discount code. You got it. There you go. Try it. You'll love it. I use them. I can't tell you enough how much I love this product. I think it's a genius product. And you've heard it right from the master himself. Get your P3OM. Let us know how you feel about it. Lots of love. I went surfing this morning after yoga with my wife. And um, it was my first public appearance since I've been labeled by our media in Australia as a neo-Nazi and a racist, which I am not. <laughs> which is so – anybody that knows you has just got to be laughing at that. I mean, it's just like, are you kidding me? Based on, you know, what happened, for example, when you mentioned your, your, uh, you shared my podcast and it triggered off five headline news uh, mentions of you and me both as anti-vaxxers, you know, in negative light, but it shot the number of listens through the roof. And I thought this is just perfect because people that are listening because they want to know just, you know, how wild and crazy or off these devil worshipers are, are going to come face to face with a very profound education. And it's going to have the opposite effect on, on them. It's going to plant seeds of truth in their head that they're going to have to deal with. <laughs> exactly. And, and I'm grateful for that experience, you know, and for when I did share that um, podcast that you did with Sherry Tenpenny, and now I've had the great fortune, thank you to you, to interview her two or three times and share her words of wisdom and your words of wisdom. And going back to this morning, uh, I entered the public sphere by going for a surf at my local local break. And I pulled up and I had no idea because this went quite mainstream over the last week or two in Australia that, uh, that I have been labeled a, a racist and a neo-Nazi. And as soon as I pulled up into the car park, this, this man yelled out, hey, Pete Evans. I said, yes. He goes, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. You're, you, you've helped me. I listen to your podcast every day. And it's actually changed my life. And I said, well, you've changed your life, but thank you for the, the kind words. And then a minute later, a, a younger man with his young family said, Pete Evans, thank you very much for your cookbooks. You know, it's changed my life and our family's life through, through eating this way. And I said, well, thanks for the support and the trust and thanks for doing what you're doing, you know, to help the next generation. And then I walked out to the surf and another guy was walking past with his young family. And he said this, he goes, mate, thank you for standing up and you've got a lot of support out there and we're glad that there's someone with a platform like you. I was like, wow, this is fascinating. I've had three strangers come up to me and offer their support and love within five minutes. And then there I paddled you go. out. That's, wait, wait, wait that's for this. boomerang. But wait oh, okay. for this. <laughs> Talking about the boomerang, I paddled out into the surf and there was a guy – 
20 meters in front paddling. And he turned around and I smiled at him and he said, my wife's Asian and you're a, can I, I don't know whether I can use the word, but he used the C word. He goes, you're a, that. And he goes, my father fought in the war and he would have killed you for, the, for what you represent. And you're a, you're a fucking this and this and this. And I said, Hey buddy, can we, can we, do you mind if we just have a chat? You know what? I think you, you've, you've misinterpreted the media. I said, I'd really love to be able to have a chat with you. And he couldn't paddle away fast enough from me. And as he's paddling away, he's yelling obscenities at me. I was like, Oh, this is interesting. Like the, the polarity or the duality that I just experienced within a, within six or seven minutes. And then I paddle over and sit in the lineup and another guy comes over to me and says, hey, Pete, keep doing what you're doing. We love what you're doing. That I catch a few waves, I hop out, and this guy walks up to me on the headland. And I couldn't tell his energy because he was walking over quite quite fast without a smile. I'm like, oh, fuck, here we go. And he and it was a stranger, and he goes, mate, I just want to thank you for doing what you're doing. The people have no idea what's, what they're about to experience in the next 12 months when the vaccines come, and, and he goes, you're a shining light. And, and I hopped back into the car, and I drove home, and I just got home and a, an hour ago, and I told my wife, I said, what a trip. What an experience this life is that there can be so much hostility and so much love and so much everything in between. And I'm still, I, I, I'm still sort of coming to, 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 to terms with what just manifested. And Well, you know, if I could interject, Pete, I often love to share Edward Edinger, MD, a famous psychiatrist and Jungian analyst definition of consciousness. Consciousness is a psychic substance produced not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. And what we're all experiencing right now is the dialectic created out of the polarities of a perceptible positive and a perceptible negative, without which we cannot be aware of anything and grow consciousness and without consciousness, the universe has no meaning. Many of the greatest minds in quantum physics, science, cosmology, astronomy, astrology, and a long list of sciences have given ample evidence that the reason that there are sentient conscious beings in existence, all of which were created by the whole of the universe, which is scientific fact, is that without sentient beings, the universe cannot itself come to know itself, but without the polarities of the positive and the negative, the light and the dark, the good and the evil, north and south, east and west, one cannot have a conscious experience. And just to echo what you're sharing, every time I've had some kind of event like you're talking about, for which there's been plenty, it was like magic. Letters just started pouring in from everywhere. And I'm like, oh my God, here I was thinking that my business was going to be done and my career was over or whatever, but great spirits letting me know that I need to be careful about buying into illusions. And I've had it happen so many times. I have right here on my wall, which has been with me for 25 years, a beautiful poster with Albert Einstein's face on it. And it says, great spirits have always met violent opposition from mediocre minds. And whenever that kind of stuff starts happening to me, I just realize these are people that just have not learned to think critically yet. These are people that are susceptible to almost anything Anybody says that they deem an expert without realizing that experts are, uh, you know, <laughs> not always so expert. And that's just the beauty. And, and, you know, when we find the center and just see that this is what makes the show the show, 
and we have a deep, intimate relationship with God or spirit within ourselves, and we can reach into ourself and ask our soul what the truth is, then I find that the best thing that we can do for people like the guy that was shouting obscenities at you is feel sorry for him because you know he'll be the first guy in line to get all these vaccinations and chances are good people will get sick and he's going to really come to a place of crisis and have to wake up and I'll tell you what's likely to happen it might be a year it might be two years it might be three years from now but you're going to be going surfing one day and that same guy's going to come up to you and apologize and I've had it happen many many times Penny has handed me letters written by hand from doctors and therapists of all types all over the world who say basically things like, when I first came across your teachings, I hated you. I told everybody that you were an idiot. I criticized you. And inevitably, something happens. And a lot of the times they get hurt and they come to the end of the rope. And some somebody in their circle says, well, you really ought to look into what Paul Check teaches about that. And they go <laughs> back in pain, put it to work, heal themselves. And it completely changes them for the rest of their life. But, but, you know, so when we realize that sometimes it's our spiritual growth to be the punching bag for the amateur that hasn't really come to the realization that punching bags don't hit back and that's not real fight training, life will give you plenty of those opportunities. Then we can hold space for them because it's just like being in a journey with a bunch of people that are there for the wrong reasons and think they're going to find God and everything's going to be perfect. And the next thing you know, they're facing their shadow and they're screaming their heads off, running around, vomiting, bark, barfing, kicking, scratching, pulling people's hair out, turning the whole place into a hell experience. But we realize it's our job to create a safe space for them to have their experience so that they can go home and reflect on it and grow from it. So congratulations for making space for the guy out there to uh, punch the heavy bag and not get himself hurt and being patient enough for him to uh, find the truth in his own life. Mm, yeah, I, I hear you, brother. And um, I did send him love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, Sometimes uh, it's hard to do, but, but it's the bigger, it's the, it's the, it's the more... Uh, beautiful thing to do and takes us a while to get there mm, i was i was focused on the other the the, the beautiful people that had um you know they were beaming light and themselves and it was uh it was beautiful to witness and it's been a it's been a fascinating two weeks because as you said we've sold a million cookbooks over the, the last few years and my publisher dumped me uh, uh and my cookware company that I have created cookware with for the last 10 years dumped me. Uh, my coconut, coconut water company that I was involved with dumped me and, and 10 other companies that I worked with all dumped me within 24 hours. And not one of them called me and that I would consider that we've become friends over the years. And they all went into fear and panic and they did a public statement without even calling me. And it was wonderful to. It's been wonderful to witness. I was like, okay, well, this is a new change, a new direction, and we need to adapt to this. And within a week, we've got a new publisher that we're going to self-publish, which is fantastic. We're going to do other things. And it's like, okay, well, spirit is guiding us into more into more alignment. And it's been a, a wonderful two weeks. And thank you for reaching out to to do an interview as well because that also is an affirmation that this is exactly playing out as it's meant to be playing out in, in this beautiful show <laughs> that, that we're all co-creating at the moment. I'm sure all of you know that mushrooms have a wide range of amazing healing benefits and they're talked about a lot in the news these days. There's a huge amount of research going on and one of the companies that does a lot of research and produces excellent products, of course, is Symbiotica. And they have an amazing new organic longevity mushroom product 
So Shervin's here to explain to us exactly what we can expect from this amazing product. Shervin, what have you guys got coming out for us? <laughs> this one's exciting because as you know, you know, me and my family, we've been hunting mushrooms in the forests of the Pacific Northwest and, you know, Northeast Canada for a long time. And medicinal mushrooms, the, the, the background of it being a Taoist immortal practice coming from ancient China. This is, um, this is something new. And this is the first time it's ever been done before. Nobody has ever made a liposomal mushroom complex ever in the history of supplementation, at least in this epoch. And what we got in this one is we got King Trumpet, Turkey Tail, Antrodia, Maitake, and the Queen Rishi mushrooms all blended together, all grown here in San Diego in an organic grow farm, certified organic. So nothing's coming from China. And it's no offense to China, but there's a massive amounts of industrial pollution there and regulations there are really, really low. So this is, this is safe for everyone, all ages. We use organic cacao extracts, and this is almost like a dessert. It's so delicious. The benefits, we all kind of know mushrooms. It's an adaptogenic herb. It helps your body adapt to the environments. They contain B vitamins, triterpenes, metabolites, you know, vitamin D, prebiotics. They all support a healthy immune system, nervous system. They lower systemic inflammation, and it's delicious. It's like a chocolate fudge dessert, and you can use it in any way you want, any application, straight from the bottle. You can put it on top of foods. You can put it on top of fruits. I mean, this one's going viral right now in so many ways, and uh, I'm really excited for everyone to try it. Well, head on over to symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A, and get your happy California-raised sunshine mushrooms with some high-end chocolate. And what a great way to start your day and know you're loving your body. On checkout, use your code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15. That's check 15 for your 15% discount. And while you're there, check out all the amazing products at Symbiotica. You can't go wrong. My career over the last 10 or 20 years has been celebrating every culture in the world, especially indigenous culture, through the films, through the TV shows, through the, the books that I've written. You know, my latest two books that just came out in the last couple of weeks, uh, you open it up and there's recipes for every single culture because that's what we love. We love celebrating culture. And, and I'm f w what I'm seeing in the mainstream is this nearly narrowing down of identity where it f they want everybody to fit into a certain box where you and I, you and I both know and the listeners know that biodiversity and uniqueness is the secret to life and the secret and sustainability yeah bloody oath and we need going straight right back to the start of this conversation to express our uniqueness and our creativity in whatever expression that may be and i feel like that there's a a huge push at the moment in in that sort of matrix reality where conformity is where they are they want to create the new human being, so to speak, or the new paradigm, the new identity is everybody do this, everybody think this way, everybody stay in your lane, stay in the box that we design for you, and it'll yes, never happen. Yes, so we can make trillions of dollars off you and turn you into little guinea pigs where we pump you full of vaccines that have not been tested properly, have not gone through the prerequisite uh, checks with the agencies that are supposed to do it in the proper ways and having bought off all the people inside these agencies that make these decisions and the long list of other things. But, you know, reality is a very honest teacher. Reality is like the stones we were talking about. And we have to take responsibility for the choices we're making. And if we as individuals as a society or a culture become too lazy to actually do our own homework and gather the information on both sides of any argument so that we can make an informed decision and we choose the easy path, which is diverting our responsibility for using our own mind effectively to some expert, then we have to take the responsibility that comes with taking the shortcut and not using our own mind and not looking at the data on both sides 
with an open mind and talking to people that are experts on both sides. So the reality of it is, as I tell my students and people in lectures, I don't have anything against the medical drug industry because those drugs are there for the people, A, that legitimately need them because some of them are necessary, and B, those drugs are there for the people that aren't willing to sit with the pain, learn from it, and use it as a teacher to create more freedom and more wisdom. There are many people that have hired me over my career that I gave a very, very effective program and very effective training to, but they simply did not want to do the work to make change in their life. And they hoped that because I was a famous therapist that I would just fix them. And I tell them right from the front, this is a far more important process than just getting rid of your back pain or your gut pain or your depression. This is a process of coming to know who and what you really are and whenever we're not listening to our inner guidance systems, then we get to take responsibility for what we're creating unconsciously. My job isn't to force you to do anything. My job is to give you the best of the information and the techniques and skills that I have. And it's your job to put it to work and make something out of it so you can continue to live and love fully. But there's just a hell of a lot of people out there that have not matured to the point of realizing that listening to wise counsel and doing the work, even when it's uncomfortable, in the short run may be harder, but in the long run, it's very freeing. So I say that the drug industry is as big as it is because people have become pacified, complacent, and have been programmed out of thinking for themselves and into trusting any authority figure as though they were God. And the consequences of that are that we have far more deaths from medical drug complications and surgical blunders than COVID could ever cook up, even if it was magnified a thousand times over the deaths it's produced. On a, and, and this is going on every day, and people aren't paying any attention to that. But the reality of it is we all get what we create. That's the boomerang of love. And because by definition, God is a sphere whose circumference is nowhere and a center whose presence is everywhere, that ultimately means that we are the center of the universe. And whatever we put out in any way, shape, or form has nowhere to go but home. And so our life is always mirroring back what we've created. And sometimes the things that we've created, like your situation you're in, aren't because we're doing things wrong. It's because we have a social responsibility to show people what it looks like when we're standing in the fire of growth, development, and love. And when we do that as a gift to others, then they learn that fire only burns people that don't have a connection to something greater than their individual self, be that religion, be that great spirit, be that Mother Nature, be that our own soul, etc. So I think there's, you know, whatever created the universe, I've found to be very honest. And whatever created us, I've found to be honest. And so having been a student of life long enough, I know as you do, that the cream rises to the top. And sometimes we just got to go through the stirring before we get to rise to the top. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question for you, Paul. Is over the next 12 months, I, I, I don't like to use times, but let's just say 2021, what do you, what do you predict is going to manifest uh, in this realm from COVID onwards? Well, I actually did a podcast called Own 2021 in which I went through that in great detail. Uh, so I would suggest so that we can really focus on you that if you want to really know what I have to say, because it's, it's uh, about two hours of me going into that in great detail. And instead of trying to stuff it into a short answer, I think you'd probably find it quite fascinating because I do a, shall we say, a depth psychology reading on 
what's going on and where we're headed and what we need to be aware of. <laughs> but, Beautiful. Uh, I'll check it out. Well, Pete, it's uh, clear that you really are a man who embraces growth, and I'm very proud of you for that, and I'm grateful I can call you my friend. Clearly, you've devoted yourself to the issues of diet, lifestyle, and supporting the development of higher consciousness on the planet. I've got a series of questions I'd like to work through here. So I'd start off by asking you, could you encapsulate what your spiritual philosophy is? You've given us quite a glimpse into it, but if you had to sort of put it into a, a Reader's Digest sentence or paragraph, what, what is your spiritual philosophy, Pete? <laughs> I got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do. You've just pretty much outlined it. Uh, uh, yeah, I think what I mentioned before, being the student and sometimes teacher and expressing ourselves and following spirit, so to speak, or intuition as a lot of people would call it. I think I have, well, I don't think, I know I've got a good radar for, for following my intuition, even though it, um, it can be scary. Quite, quite scary at times with what we, um, what we put out into the world and, and where we go. Um, as mentioned before, my wife and I have just um, had the great fortune to be able to purchase a block of land that's 20 acres with rainforest and eight cabins, and we're opening a, a wellness and cooking retreat next year. And, awesome. And if that isn't scary, then I don't know what is because, again, it, we are starting at the start of this new adventure. And I, I, I've come to realize that putting ourselves or putting myself into this sort of uncomfortable will it work, will it won't work, whatever it may be type scenario is where I thrive and I look forward to those sort of challenges. And and to be honest with you, this has been something I've wanted to do for, for many decades now and finally I've created the the time and the space to be able to create it. And uh, I am uh, excited about it. Are there nerves in there? Yes, there's there's a little self doubt, which is always com uh, comforting, so to speak. <laughs> because without that self doubt, I don't think you know, I, I, it seems to always come up for me. And the best explanation I can give you is like when I was about to do the Magic Plant, the cannabis film. When I was flying from Australia to Canada by myself on that journey, the self-doubt was very, very loud on that plane trip. Like, what are you doing? You don't know anything about cannabis. Why are you doing this? What are you leaving your, your family for to go on this strange adventure? And as soon as I sat down with my first guest, my interview subject, uh, a fellow called Marcus Richardson, also known as Bubble Man, Within a minute of sitting opposite him and and pressing record, I just had this knowing that I was in the right place, exactly the right place where I'm meant to be on my journey in that experience. And it's it's the same with this block of land. And my wife and I, Nick, went out and looked at it, and that same feeling comes through. It's like this is exactly where we're meant to be right now. This is the next part of the adventure. And I think once we can cultivate that knowing even if there is a little self-doubt in there, and then that, that sort of reaffirmation in oneself once we're going through the experience that, yes, this is exactly where we're meant to be, I think that's that has really helped me along this journey. And I don't need to – I've, I've come to the realisation I don't really need to explain it to anybody, and I think that is no. quite a, a refreshing place to be that it may seem like a strange adventure, but that's okay because nobody else has to live it except for myself. And my wife is is on board and we're looking forward to doing something like this together and seeing how that journey goes for us together in this relationship as well. You know, she's a she's an amazing, um, amazing human being that can hold space when she serves uh, she does beautiful tea ceremonies and she's a yogini and I'm really looking forward to being in that, in that environment with her 
while she shares her gifts and holds space for so many people to to tap into their higher self and into their breath and into their their spirit. So it's exciting because yeah, it's beautiful, still, and we're still work we're working it out as we go along too, which is part of the the beauty of it. Yeah, and you know. If I had anything to share with you, I would just share that whenever self-doubt shows up in my inner self, I just say thank you for showing me that I have an opportunity to talk to my soul about this. And whenever I get the green light from my soul, I know that come hell or high water, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and I'm doing God's work. And if they split me open and gut me, that'll be just fine because I'm in line with my soul, and I know all I can take with me when I die is what I've become, and whether someone else agrees with me or not is their issue, but as long as I've got the green light from great spirit, that I'm devoted. <clears throat> so if, if I have anything to share with you on that regard, Pete, it's just let the self-doubt be an invitation to hold still and open your heart to soul hmm. and put it on the table and then see what happens from there. And uh, my soul has directed me to do many things that I thought were just way over the top. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And my soul <laughs> says, have more faith in yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah I Look love what that. you've done so far. <laughs> well, that was manifested this morning in the surf because after that experience with the, with the unhappy man, uh, the next person I bumped into was a, acupuncturist from the United States who's treated my wife and I hadn't met him before. And he goes, Pete, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing great. And he said, I hear you're opening a retreat. I'd love to be able to come, to work with you on this. And that's over the last few few months since we've pressed go on this, my intention has been to bring in beautiful uh, practitioners from all different modalities, whether it be body work, spirit work, or energy work, or whatever it may be into this experience where we are creating a community of wonderful, wonderful, not only healers, but therapists and human beings that, that can also share their expressive, uh, their, their, their expression. So um, that was a reaffirmation this morning, which was beautiful. Yes, well, God speaks in a myriad of ways, you know, Angie, my second wife, is a highly skilled shaman, and she teaches a whole course on how to read nature and the environment as a means of getting communication from Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Great Spirit, or even your soul. And it just blows people's minds when she takes them through all these things, which can seem quite wild and crazy, like go outside and walk around the building and see which plant you feel this attraction to. And then she takes them through a series of steps on how to read the plant. And the next thing you know, they're having a realization that gives them an answer to a question they've had sometimes for their whole life that they could never find the answer in books or from teachers and things like that. And it just blows their mind. So, you know, the way you're, you're engaging this is really allowing the world to speak to you. And, and so though you had one guy cussing at you, you also had far more people giving you reaffirmation of the value that you've brought to the world. So I think that, uh, the, you know, the, the, like I say, the, 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 uh, the universe is weighted toward love and anytime we're acting for the betterment of all, then we're protected, and the worst thing that can happen to us is we die, and we meet all the souls that have died that way, and they're there to hug us and celebrate with us and say, good job. Now you know what love's really all about. And so with that, I'm curious, what do you feel the essentials of a – or the essential components of a healthy lifestyle are, Pete? Mm, great question. Wow. <laughs> uh, good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably uh, yeah, that's important. Yeah, <laughs> amen. I think I'll so. add that to my list. <laughs> uh, definitely, being in awe and wonder, I think, was deeply um, resonated with me recently. 
when I was over in Costa Rica, because I did ask the question. I asked that very simple question that you just asked. And the answer that came in that experience was be in awe and wonder of everything. Sure makes life magical. In it, of everything. the Again, I'll use those words, the good, the bad. And as you and I know, there probably we there is no good or bad or right or wrong or black or white. There's just everything. So to be in awe and wonder of everything is and to enjoy the show and to do in, and to be in awe and wonder of our own participation is is a pretty good uh, philosophy that I need to remember more often that's for sure then obviously we have the pillars of health you know and I was fortunate enough to write a book uh, two years ago which came out last year called heal healthy eating and living where I got to write down 101 different ways in which we can go on this journey and I, I put it into chapters such as reflection, connection, nourishment, uh, movement, play, um, remembrance, and so many others, other aspects of what it means to be human and to celebrate that and to embrace that and to nourish those aspects and to, and to take a deep dive into them. And whether that is how we sleep or how we love or how we view nature or how we fuel ourselves, how we breathe. And, you know, there's so much in which we can learn. And that's why I think we started this conversation that we're the eternal student. And I know over the years, you know, I've been a voracious reader. And sometimes I step away from that where I don't feel like reading. And I know even over the last couple of years, it's, it's, it's been something I haven't been attracted to, but I know that I have a feeling that next year I'll go back into that, that mode of reading a lot again. And it's to not be, not judge ourselves harshly when we're going along this journey, I think is, is really powerful for us as well that we do have these ebbs and flows. The the tide goes in, the tide goes out, our our attention gets taken in one direction and then we bring it back into another. And you know, I think I wish there was a guidebook for us, but I think that then would be uh, irrelevant or obs- you know, I, it's sort of better that there's no guidebook for us if 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 that makes sense. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, if, if there's a guidebook, it was written by somebody else and you're not that person. That's the, that's the key thing. We're, we're creating our own guidebook through life experience. And that's what makes each of us so unique and special because there will never be another Pete Evans ever. You're the one off, Pete. So there's no guidebook for a one off. You're, you have to write it yourself. And that's called the journey of life, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And I'm grateful. You know, it it sort of pisses me off a little bit that the education system didn't prepare us for all of these, these or give us these life skills, or our parents didn't really teach us these life skills. In my experience, but I'm also so grateful for that that I've had to discover them as an adult and go on this journey of again being the student and uncovering some of these 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 truths that resonate with me in myself. That's what inspires people like you and I and others to share because we realize how many people are being misled or poorly educated or miseducated or not educated. And um, when we realize how vital certain types of information and education are, then it just comes pouring out of our heart as a gift. And there's your 20 books and all your documentaries and your websites and your podcasts right there. And uh, actually, I wanted to share with you, by the way, we have also got a own 2021 from seven of the most powerful women I've ever met in my life, which is the podcast directly after mine. And I've, encouraged as many men as I could possibly get to listen to it, to listen to it, because I think it's a profound opportunity for men to have an experience of the depths of the knowledge and the wisdom of intelligent, beautiful, spiritually evolved and powerful women. 
And my intuition is that your wife will absolutely love it. So when you find the own 2021 by me, the next one is the uh, is Penny, five of our instructors from the Czech Institute, and one of my uh, clients who's also a Czech professional, but is very deeply evolved and has her own podcast. And I'll tell you what, that podcast brought me to tears multiple times. I was just so blown away by the depth and the beauty and the wisdom. And it was so lovely to see life from a woman's perspective and hmm. what it meant to them to own 2021. So I just wanted to say that before I forgot to tell you, because I thought it would be a great experience for you and your wife to, to hear it from the feminine perspective uh, mm, for thanks, lots Paul. of, yeah, you know, uh, I would love to hear what your philosophy on diet entails. And I know that that can be a big question, but in broad strokes, what do you feel people need to uh, take out of their diet? What do you feel would be wise for them to put into their diets? And particularly people that don't have the financial freedom to just buy and eat whatever they'd like to. You know, I'm fortunate that I've worked hard enough and have had the grace of God to make enough money that if I want a, you know, bottle of such and such supplement or if I want to buy organic free range meats and even have to bring them in from another state, I can make it happen. But the grand majority of the people out there are not in that position. So I would love it if from your perspective as a world famous chef and expert on these topics, if you could sort of give us some broad strokes on your diet philosophy and where you feel people could benefit by adding key things or taking key things out and keeping in mind people that maybe are, are kind of having a hard time making ends meet with a lot of people in that state right now due to COVID and, mm -hmm. and all the financial hardships that's happened. Yeah, I understand. And for sure, I'll go back to the, the magic pill, the documentary we made. And I made a 16 episode series called the paleo way also. And I believe those two series and the film pretty much sum up our, our philosophy really well in the paleo way uh, series. It's a half an hour cooking episode. We've got 16 of them and each one focuses on a different theme. Um, we start off with the paleo principles and then we talk about being a hunter, we talk about being a gatherer, we talk about sustainable seafood, we talk about uh, more plant-based, we talk about fats, we talk or healthy fats, we talk about offal, we talk about fermented foods, uh, we talk about local regenerative farms. So I guess to put it in a nutshell, and it was so interesting when we made The Magic Pill the documentary on food because the director that I used, um, Rob Tate, who's a, who's a wonderful human being, we he pulled out the part that I really wanted to have in, which was the solution based, and it's a little montage which I ended up we ended up putting back into the film, which really sums it up. And the premise of this little montage that goes for about a minute or two is: eat organic if you can. Eat nose to tail if you can, if you're going to eat animals. Um, make sure those animals have had a healthy existence or a healthy lifestyle so they haven't been caged or uh, put into a feedlot or farmed in a net like uh, some aquaculture does. And focus on nose to tail. And what that means is the offal. So the men, my wife, we've got, we've, we're looking forward to once we get off this, uh, this chat, we've got some blood sausages we're going to be cooking up with some eggs. And anybody that's never had a blood sausage, I would highly recommend that you give it a try because it's pig's blood, pig's fat, and pig's meat with some spices. And it's very famous in different cultures around the world. The Vietnamese have their own version, as do the Chinese, as do the Scottish and the Irish and the English and the French and the Italians. And it, the list goes on and on. And we, I was a very fussy child. And when I became a chef, I knew I had to face another fear, which was all the icky foods that are out there that I didn't grow up with, which was the nose to tail, the liver, the brains, the sweetbreads, the bone marrow, the kidneys, the, the blood, the testicles, whatever it may be. But I had to just change my perspective. And the beautiful thing about cooking is that different cultures have worked out these wonderful recipes over millennia 
hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, thousands of years, hundreds of years in which they have learnt to create these masterpieces that have become classics. So if you've never had crumbed brains, for instance, then you're in for a treat. If you've never had roasted sweetbreads that have been served with some burnt uh, pastured butter, for instance, you're in for a treat. If you've never had uh, a traditional liver pate or terrine, you're in for a treat because these these recipes have been perfected to the point that they are some of the most delicious foods in the world. If you've never had a freshly shucked oyster that is at the perfect temperature, that is in peak season, there is nothing more beautiful and satisfying than that experience. And that to me is the perfect food, the oyster. Not to mention it's an aphrodisiac. <laughs> well, yes, of course. And <laughs> go for you the may, gusto. <laughs> you, you may have to uh, enter into your fear. You might have to embrace that fear or step into your own comfortableness to push through and learn to appreciate it because trust me, I was so fussy, but I, it was a challenge for me. I was like, my intention is to learn to not only be able to tolerate these foods, but to love these foods. And now I have to say that those foods are some of my most sought after in the world now that I would, I want to be eating on a weekly basis. So going back to it, nose to tail, healthy animals, is sort of a prerequisite prerequisite. Um, fermented foods. If you can tolerate them, I think is, is fantastic. Whether it be a fermented beverage or fermented food like kimchi or sauerkraut, I think can offer great benefit for some people. And if not many people, um, any fruits and vegetables that haven't been sprayed with toxic chemicals that are in season and local, I think is worth including into your diet. If you can grow your own, even better. Uh, we've just got a, my wife bought a, uh, a passion fruit plant yesterday. So we're going to plant that today. And we're looking forward to seeing what, what we can harvest off that. Um, where else do we go with this? We go into maybe eliminating certain foods that might be inflammatory for you. And you might have to go on a journey to discover what they, they are. Uh, but definitely anything that has been sprayed with modern poisonous chemicals would probably be a good thing to eliminate from your diet. And generally, the things that have been sprayed the most through the work of Stephanie Seneff and her work with glyphosate would be the grains and the soy and the cereal uh, products that are out there. And it's not necessarily that they are they're evil foods or anything. It's just how we're growing them these days that can be really have a devastating effect on our gut microbiome. And for some people, certain grains are best eliminated from their diet or uh, if they're prepared in the correct way, the ancient way that uh, someone like Sally Fallon from Nourishing Traditions can teach you, then that might be a really good um, journey for somebody to go on nourishing traditions, so to speak. So that's, and, and we are a big fan of broth. Uh, I roasted a couple of chickens the other night for, for my kids and uh, for guests. And the next day I took all of those chicken carcasses and the wings that were left and made the most beautiful broth with that. And that then can become either a little tonic or a beverage that you're drinking a chicken broth or a beef, beef broth or a game broth. And then you can turn that into a soup or this, that, and the other. So Really, I love to look at traditional foods from all around the world and celebrate them in their simplicity. Or if you want to, if you, if you love spending time in the kitchen, then you can make them as complicated as you like. And then when it comes to budget, the, the fascinating thing about this way of eating is you'll probably end up spending less because, as you said earlier, once you're nourished, you're nourished. You know, when, when we're not nourishing our body and we're eating fake food, as I like to call it, you can keep consuming and consuming because your body is starving for nourishment. Whereas if you're eating a couple of beautiful eggs, if you can tolerate them or some fatty meat or fatty seafood and some organic vegetables or tubers, whatever it may be, you will be nourished and you'll find, I mean, I generally eat one to two meals a day depending 
on my output. And that's a, that's a very different scenario than a lot of the population that might eat three, four, five, six, seven times a day. So, but I always encourage people to find out what works for them. You know, people, t- people talk about it a bit of fasting and that seems to work for me, but it doesn't work for everybody else. So I'm very cautious that you have to experiment for yourself what works for you at particular times of the year wherever you are geographically located. If you're living in a cold area, then salads may not be the smartest choice. If you're living in a hot area, then, you know, casseroles or stews may not be the wisest choice for you in that temperate area all year lo- all year long. So we have to cultivate some com- common sense when it comes to diet. Yeah, it's true. You know, we've talked a bit about plant medicines and your experiences and I have a long, <laughs> amazing and deep history and uh, exploration and guiding healing ceremonies for too many people to count in my career. But uh, I'd love to explore a little bit with you in that area. Um, to start with, what do you feel consciousness is or how would how would you describe conscious i gave it a, a definition of consciousness earlier i'm just curious you know consciousness is something that we come face to face with in a plant medicine ceremony what does that word mean to you oh again i i i I struggle a little bit with definitions of <laughs> these types of things paul it's like, i still haven't worked that one out but uh to give you an overview i i when I was really like a teenager, age 17 onwards, I, I experimented with a lot of different recreational uh, substances. And my favorite one through that period was acid or LSD until the age of 19 where, and I would consume it every week pretty much. And until one time when I was lying on my couch and I didn't think I was going to get out of that bad trip for 12 hours and, and <laughs> I didn't touch a I didn't touch a psychedelic again for nearly wow that was 19 until 44 years of age maybe so what's that that's a long time it, 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 yeah 20 it, 23 it, years or 20 25 years or something like that 24 yeah it it challenged me because it it was a it was a pretty heavy experience I was like whoa you know that that was a uh, it was a shock to my system because I was having such a great experience prior to that. And then that one experience was, it, it, it rocked my world because I didn't think I was going to come back into the, this reality the same way ever again. I thought I'd be stuck in that. And, uh, that wasn't good for me at that particular point in time. Um, but perhaps it was. And then, um, my next experience. Might have saved your life. It, it, it probably did. I would say. And my next experience was, as I mentioned earlier, was with toad medicine. So that was my reintroduction into the into the entheogenic world or the the expanded consciousness world, and what a teacher that was for me. And I went into it knowing nothing about it, which I think was a saving grace for me, actually, because I had no idea what was about to unfold, and in that experience of going through what I can only call ego death or that that death process and experiencing all that ever has been and all that ever will be in every single possible permutation, it it was so familiar and so beautiful and terrifying at the same time that my perception on myself but also this reality has changed forever and what it taught me or what i taught myself in that experience was that life is a is a beautiful gift and that when you experience for me when i experienced that death process and coming through it 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 took away fear of death and not in a in a way where I'm going to jump off the roof and, and 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 pretend that I won't get hurt or won't die, but it, it gave me a greater appreciation for life. And at the same time, 
gave me the realization that this is an illusionary reality, so somewhat akin to a, a dream state. But in saying that, it's a dream state in which we uh, can co-create or create or manifest our own reality, um, consciously and subconsciously. And I'm fascinated about this now that we have the opportunity to navigate our way through this experience that we call life, yet still have the understanding that at the end of this experience, it is ultimately as beautiful and there is no fear about the transitional experience that will take take shape or take form for us. And I'm grateful to have this experience as Pete Evans <laughs> in this journey. And 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 I have since that time journeyed in different um with different medicines and from ketamine to cactus to psilocybin to uh ayahuasca and there's still many that i would like to have a relationship with or form a relationship with and learn from but it's it's a it's an unusual experience once you have gone through that because take for instance 2020 and we've just turned into December today. It's December the first year for me. And this whole year since COVID has hit, I have had not one one desire or inclination that I needed to um, journey with any plant medicine or, or animal medicine this year. It's, a spirit has been telling me you need to be grounded in this experience for, for yourself throughout this whole whatever this is this this great awakening or this great scam that is happening don't journey elsewhere anywhere by using any other means other than perhaps your breath and meditation and i've taken that on board so i have no idea when those next journeys may take form or what they may be for me and if if they if it does call for me again then then i will go um and experience what 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 may unfold but if it doesn't, then I'm equally okay with that as well. You know, it, it's it's fascinating, and at the same time, it's it's um, it's intriguing <laughs> what these medicines offer and what they don't offer. It's a paradox. Yes. Yeah. It's it's a. It's more than a few words can wrap up, but I think you've done a great job of showing that you've reached a level of maturity that you can follow your your soul's in instincts and intuition and listen and stand in the sweet spot. You know, a lot of people are looking for the next great way to blow their head off or fix their life with another magic pill or potion and, uh, you know... It, it, a, a real plant medicine ceremony is something that needs to be approached as a death experience. And if you don't approach it that way, then my experience is you're probably going to have a very interesting ride and will wish you'd have been a little more patient. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you definitely get what you need. That's for sure. And people, yeah. people come from all over the world to see me after they've, gone into the jungle sometimes many times in a row some four or five times in a month doing you know heavy ayahuasca and then toad medicine and whatever else they can get their hands on and next thing you know their life's turned inside out uh because they're trying to find themselves externally instead of sitting with the medicines as teachers and going home and doing the healing work and the growth work that the spirits give us instead of running after the next magic. All I got to do is one more ceremony and my wife will love me. My kids will behave and uh, I'll get a big raise at work and everything will be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm very, very cautious not to encourage that sort of um, exploration. I always say, if it calls for you, then 
it calls to you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And there's no right or wrong in that experience. You know, some people need that sort of experience to heal some very deep wounds or to understand their place in in this existence and other people don't need it you know and it's it's such a tr- it's such a tricky thing again going back into that student teacher role that there's a lot of responsibility comes and when i've shared you know i still when i do podcasts i invite people on and i still ask them questions about this what does this mean what did i experience what's your take on it you know and i think i'll probably spend the rest of my life um trying to make sense of these experiences that I've been through because it's 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 life shattering and life changing and transformative in it's in you, you can't sum it up in a few words because it actually changes your perception on on reality and who you are and I find that does and you know even this year going back into Costa Rica last year, I, I visited what I would call the the realm of infinite possibilities in one of my journeys with ayahuasca, and and I had a, uh, I guess a, a not a premonition, but an understanding of what was coming down the line. And this is in October and November last year before COVID. But I I had this sort of sinking feeling that shit was going to get fucking pretty dark out there in the world, and. It wasn't until this this year I was like, okay. And in that experience, I knew that I would have to step up into this into this role, no matter how difficult it may be. And and I'm still coming to terms with that. Whether I've manifested this, <laughs> you know, part of me has manifested whatever is happening in the world because you, sometimes you do have those these thoughts because. When you understand that you do co-create this experience, that um, it can be challenging. Yes, but that's what makes it beautiful, and that's what gives us the growth opportunity. I mean, nobody walks into a gym and is surprised because there's resistance <laughs> devices everywhere. They all go, "Well, I'm <laughs> going here to use wrist resistance and practice overcoming it." And you know, the collective of humanity has gotten very, very lazy and has really delayed their own growth and development into adulthood and self-reliance and self-responsibility. So I think that the collective has called this experience in to create a, uh, shall we say, um, the urge to use the word enemy is there, but to create an experience that will bring us up against our own self and our need to stand up for what we believe in, including the sovereignty of our own bodies and our own minds, and, and, and also get clear on the kind of culture we want to have for our kids and what, the, what we want the world to be like. Because if we continue to stand back and be passive, the same people that have been pumping everyone full of drugs and false information and censoring truth and getting rid of diversity in agriculture and diversity in thinking are going to continue to try their little farming project. And uh, I think for most of us, the human spirit is really oriented toward freedom. And a lot of us are going to have to collectively say, what do we need to do right now to protect our freedoms and create new ways of being and relating that bring us back into harmony with each other and the planet? Because the ulterior mode, the only alternative to that is to let go and just be controlled and be put into an invisible jail and have everything tracked and reported and be a pin cushion for everybody's, uh, you know, every other drug company and and basically become uh, guinea pigs for the billionaires of the world, which for me is just absolutely unacceptable. And I think for most human beings, it's unacceptable. So just like when you're in a, a, a shamanic journey and you hit the darkness, there's nowhere you can run from it because it's inside of you. There's nowhere you can run from your culture because it's who you are. You can't run from the world. Even if you have a rocket, you're, you're going to have to come back because you can't take that much with you. And unless you can get 
all your family and all your friends in that rocket and feed them and keep them safe, it's not going to work very well. So we're all here sitting around the campfire and we've got decisions to make together. And I'm absolutely, as much as it irritates me because I don't like being manipulated by people with money, it excites me because I've got enough life experience to know when it's time for a ceremony into adulthood and it's here. Mm. It's definitely here, my friend, and uh, I'm not, just not sure whether everybody realizes that they're in their ceremony at the moment of the initiation. But uh, well, I think they're, it's, they're going uh, to. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess they're we can, going to. The people listening to this, and yourself, and your colleagues, and the people you've trained, uh, the ones that can help stay grounded through this and shine the light on the darkness and and show a way through, hopefully. Yes. As an alchemist myself, Pete, I'm curious to hear what you've learned about life and consciousness from practicing alchemy in the kitchen, be it making food, supplements, herbal medicines, or even plant formulations. And to sort of help shape that up a little, did you ever read Michael Pollan's book on cooking? I can't remember the title of it. Uh, What was his? The Omnivore's Dilemma? Or was uh, it the other I one? I don't think it was that one. It was one on, uh, he went into cooking a lot and he he really used the alchemical approach of earth, water, fire, and air. And he talked about, you know, how, for example, water is so important in cooking and different effects it has on food and heat and fire and air. And it was just, he had an amazing section of the alchemy of cooking. And since life as we know it is made of earth, water, fire, air, and space. And everything you're cooking is something that's more water-like or more earth-like or more fiery-like, like a pepper or more air-like. So popcorn is very airy, for example. And you're always working with those elements in the kitchen. And so I was just curious if, you, if you'd kind of gathered any correlations between what it takes to be a great chef and work with food and the principles of alchemy and how that that may actually um, have shaped your view of life. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because my wife just last year got a tattoo on her, on her forearm, which was the elements. And uh, when we, when we purchased this uh, block of land, beautiful sacred uh, land the what was coming through to me was you're going to just use uh, fire to do your cooking demonstrations on and I was like okay this is this is interesting and it just felt really really real to me and I think it also went back into uh, when I was in Costa Rica last year I had quite a few conversations with the fire pit <laughs> and the moon <laughs> Yes, and we had the, a conversation with the fire pit recently too. Our barbecue <laughs> caught on fire and almost lit our whole house on fire. And Angie had to call 911 and they came in with sledgehammers and axes. And now instead of an outdoor barbecue pit, I've got about a $12,000 hole in the side of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And <sighs> and in, in that experience, the fire was having a chat with me. I was having a chat with it, however you want to interpret it. But uh it was saying that both is um, good. Y- use me, and I will. I will create the most beautiful tasting recipes for you and your friends. And so, I have. We've created a beautiful fire pit that will be going in in about a month's time with the landscapers. And I've actually ordered a an American barbecue smoker slash barbecue because one of the best meals I've ever eaten in my life was in i think it was louisiana and when yes. i was filming uh-huh. they're famous used- for their barbecues oh wow mate wow and for eight years i hosted a tv show in the u.s on pbs called a movable feast where i got to travel around the united states and work with some of america's best cooks and chefs and the best meal i ever had was cooked in louisiana with one of these barbecues and they did a brisket and I was, I've cooked a million meals with my two hands. I've eaten 
so many dishes from all walks of life, all cultures, from the five-star or three Michelin hat restaurants down to street stalls in Asia. And this piece of meat that this person cooked for me, it was grass-fed organic brisket, and all they put on it was salt and pepper and a little vinegar spray, and they slow cooked it in one of those beautiful American barbecues over wood for eight hours. And they sliced wow. that piece of meat for me, didn't put anything with it, just let me eat it. And I can still remember that it is the single best piece of meat I've eaten in my entire life. And when I was thinking about the type of cooking that I want to do at this retreat, fire just kept coming, fire and wood and air, obviously, and smoke and beautiful. I, I just want to recreate that experience because that is my definition of of art, of beauty, of culinary simplicity, one ingredient with salt and pepper using the elements to create the most most mouth-watering piece of meat <laughs> in, in my life. And obviously we'll put oysters in there, we'll smoke other things and do this and that and seafood or whatever combination of vegetables. Uh, but that's my next journey is to cultivate a relationship as a chef with fire. And that might sound strange after being a chef for 30 years because we use gas, we use whatever modalities we have at our, at our fingertips. But fire is the most primal of the, the ways in which we can harness energy and turn something into a masterpiece. So again, I'm going back to that beginner stage as a chef, even though I know how to put combinations of ingredients together, but harnessing fire is something that I'm excited to be, become a beginner again and take our guests on that journey with me until I am quite experienced in that realm. And whether that takes me a year or 10 years, who knows, but I'm looking forward to that journey and that that element of growth. So I guess the alchemy is going to be coming again for me in that realm. But again, going back to what I've learned over the years of being a chef is it's pretty simple. To make a, a wonderful dish, we need fat in the form of whether it's fat from the animals or fat from plants or olive oil, coconut, uh, lard, tallow, chicken fat, duck fat, goose fat, whatever it may be. Uh, teamed with salt. Salt is an essential ingredient for, for us and the most beautiful salt we can obtain from. And we've got salt from all around the world, including Australia. And it was funny the other day, I was down at uh, the local beach in Sydney, Bondi Beach, and I took our, our beautiful dog for a walk. And there's North Bondi, Bondi Headland, and very few people actually walk around the headland where the, where the, the the waves break and it was low tide and I was out there giving my dog a walk, giving our dog a walk. And I could see these little pools of where water had been and it had evaporated and what was left was salt. And I'm, I'm putting my finger in there and putting it into my mouth and I'm eating the, 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 the most natural salt. And who would have thought that Sydney had its own salt <laughs> reservoir, even though it was very small. So we have fat, we have salt, we have acid in the form of either vinegar, citrus, such as lime, lemon, um, grapefruit, whatever, uh, even kombucha or wine. We have this acid element. And then we have spice. And spice can be whatever you like, whether it be a little bit of spiciness from pepper or chili, like you mentioned before, or peppers. Um, and different spices as well, those earthy ones like turmeric or garlic or cumin, these, these wonderful spices. So whenever you're designing a recipe to cook at home, I always take into consideration those, the, the salty element, the sour element or acidic element, the fattiness, the fatty element, and then always the spicy element into that. And if you can combine those, those four ingredients into a dish, whether it be a salad dressing to make your greens or your salad come to life, that's the simple 
uh, formula for that. Um, if you wanted to create a nice little sauce for your steak or your fish, then that's the elements again, salt, some lemon or some vinegar, a little bit of fat, such as olive oil or some sort of fat that you, avocado, for instance, and then a little bit of spice. And once you have that formula, that then creates for savory dishes anyway. It, it turns it from simple to alchemical, I believe, into something that's that becomes I don't want to use the addictive because I, I know you mentioned before you, you steer clear of addictive things, but it, it creates this this wonderful play of tastes and sensations for our palate that becomes where you want to go back and eat, eat and eat and crave that food. You know, I have a quick question for you. Is the the vinegar, you know, acids are very effective, as you know, at breaking bonds. What's the... Uh, what are some of the functions that the acid brings, like vinegar or any of the other acids? Like, what are they doing in the food that makes it so special and unique? Well, I think it does something different depending on what you, you're teaming it with. But for me, it's always been about balance. I remember the first, when I went to culinary school, the first thing we actually learned in French culinary school was how to make stocks or broths, bone broths. Who would have thought that <laughs> the thing that has become very popular in the health? world has its origins in flavor you know and and traditional french cookery and the the next thing that we learned was sauces and dressings and it was always about balance it's about balance so even these really rich um sauces that we would make take for instance a beurre blanc which is a, a butter sauce that traditional french you make that with uh a little bit of vinegar or white wine and you reduce that down and then you whisk in butter. So you've got your fat and then you finish it again with a little bit of uh, lemon juice or something. So it's, it's, this, it's this dance on the palate um, between this acidic and fatty nature. And I, I'm not exactly sure what it does in the body. I'm not that um, scientifically minded, so to speak. But all I know is every most traditions have used these elements in one way, shape, or another, if you, <clears throat> if you go to Southeast Asia, you'll notice like in a green papaya salad or a curry, they always combine the fish sauce, which is the salty. They've got the, the, the fattiness, which is some sort of oil in there. And then they'll have the vinegar or the lime juice or the acidity in there. And then you do go to Fran France and they have the same understanding of it you go to russian cuisine they have the same thing you know um scandinavian cuisine they've got the pickles you go to uh, fiji and you look at what they create with their raw ceviche raw kokoda dish which is raw fish with coconut milk which or coconut cream which is the fattiness but then they put in the squeeze of lime juice so there's these recurring themes that happen through all different cultures that have these underlying foundational principles, which is the balance of these, these, um, these ingredients in whatever way, shape, or form they happen. And, and when we think about saltiness, we think about, again, Southeast Asia, what do they use? In Vietnam and Thailand and Laos, they use fish sauce. When you go to China, they use soy sauce. Uh, so they've... It's always these plays, and and when you take a, a really good look at it from a global or a world view, it's it's the same formula that seems to permeate all these different cuisines and cultures. And for that, I'm extremely grateful because then you've worked out the formula to create amazing dishes, which you can create in a in a second at home or a few seconds. Pete, I want to ask you kind of a deep question, and I suspect you have the depth to answer it. If you can imagine that humanity as a whole is a living being, and each human being is like a cell within our body, and just as all the cells in our, our body make up the totality of ourselves as a being, where would you see humanity is in its growth and development stage towards enlightenment? So if you look at humanity, not as a collection of individuals, but as one being, for example, and you looked at it like Carl Jung might analyze a patient in the stages of their own growth and development, 
I'm just curious to where you think we're at right now. It's a, it's a fascinating question, and I, I really don't know how to answer it, to be honest with you, because, I mean... <sighs> yeah, you know, it's cool. I, I, just, I just was curious, because with your mind as a chef, if we could use the metaphor... You know, there's a process, right? When you cook something, there's the preparation or the beginning. First, you got to buy the ingredients. Then you got to, you know, have the right pots and the right forms of utensils to do the job. And then you have to, you know, put it in the oven at the right temperature. And then you have temperature checks and and checking the softness or you know, the stickiness or, you know, will the spaghetti stick to the wall or whatever? And then there's the, okay, it's time to take it out. And then sometimes there's a cooling process and various stages. I think I'd go back to what we were saying earlier about the diversity and the, our uniqueness. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people would ask me over the years, what is my favorite food to eat? And it's a very difficult question to answer it goes back to you talking about eating turkey 325 days in a row or 365 days in a row it's you know i can look at a cuisine like indian or sri lankan where there's 30 ingredients in it to make the most amazing curry spice or or curry dish that has the the technicality and the balance again to create a dish like one of those phenomenal dishes like a vindaloo or a um, whatever it may be that that the philosophy that a lot of us go by is less is more but then you encounter a cuisine like indian and and it goes out the door because it is so complex and so vibrant and so full of life and and um, wonder and color, and you can't help but feel amazing when you put that first mouthful in, and it's just, it's 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 just it's nearly overwhelming to the senses. That yeah, it's, it's like an explosion. It is, but then we go back to what I talked about before, having an oyster with, which I believe is the perfect food. You know, and our indigenous um, ancestors, that's what they used to eat. In, in Australia, for instance, there's what is called mittens, which is shellfish mounds that have been created over tens of thousands of years of oyster shells or mussel shells or shellfish shells where they've gone down to the ocean or wherever it may be and, and cracked open an oyster and eaten it. And you can see that there's tens of thousand years of history of these mounds of shells that have been built up. And what's better, a freshly shucked oyster with nothing on it, which I believe is the most beautiful experience one can ever have because it's, it's, it's an intimate affair with nature. It's an intimate experience. You're actually eating something live in that moment that is full of vitality and and just the explosion of creaminess and seawater and and mineral uh, composition in something like that and you get the terroir of of the ocean and the environment y- yet the next meal that night you could be eating that curry that I talked about which has 30 ingredients in it now which one is a better dish you know and I think we celebrate them all and everything in between that. So where are we with humanity at the moment? We're in a melting pot of all different ideas, philosophies, uh, perceptions, <sighs> ideologies, and whatever else may come through emotions and spiritual growth and learnings. And again, we'll go back to let's be in awe and wonder all, of all of that because some people are actually in the stew, so to speak, and it's 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 it hasn't got balance. Other people are have in in an experience where they they are the master chefs of their life, and they are creating something new and wondrous every day. Whereas there's other people that are just at the beginning and of their journey, and they're they're witnessing that experience of their first oyster, where they might have been repulsed from it of it of eating something like that for 20 years because it had been conditioned or programmed into their experience that that is a disgusting thing to to eat. 
yet they might be going through their first spiritual journey or epiphany of of discovering something new and reprogramming not only their palates but their belief systems and their perspectives of life. So I, I don't want to judge where we're at because we're all on a, on a separate journey. And all I can say is it's it's it, right now we have the I believe we're in the best time of of humanity because we do have access to all of this if we choose to and we can go as simple as we like as complicated as we like we can we can experiment with different spices with different beliefs with different perspectives as we've discussed over the last couple of hours whether it be through diet through belief systems and through plant medicines or meditation or spiritual work or uh becoming a warrior or becoming a hermit or becoming fearful or becoming a being of love and light and understanding. And again, there's no right or wrong and there's no judgment. And I go through all of these experiences pretty much on a day-to-day basis. Sometimes I, I want to be the warrior spirit. Sometimes I want to run away and become the hermit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sometimes, yes. I, sometimes I want to eat oysters. Sometimes I want to eat curries. And other times, you know, fast food might tempt me. Or the cocaine the other day was offered to me as like another opportunity to say no. And no, this is, this is the path. Yes, that's good. There's there's a lot of wisdom in there. As an expert on food, I'm curious to hear your views on what the impact of commercial farming and food, the food production industry, the commercial industry, has been on human health intelligence. And as an exercise here, hopefully this one's not so tricky for you. If you look into your crystal ball, which you know psychics use to tell the future and witches, as you look into the future, say for the next three to five years or even ten years. If we don't make some significant changes with how we relate to raise and consume foods, um, what do you see happening? Mm, it's not only to humans, but to the planet. I mean, I know you spent a lot of time looking at these issues. We both do. So um, use your chef's hat. Pretend you're in the kitchen watching a bunch of young beginning chefs playing with fire and they're trying, you know, bring in a little gasoline and a little uh, lighter fluid and some fingernail polish and getting a little crazy with their experiment, surely you're going to have something to say to them. So if we look at that analogy from the perspective of, of all the chemicals and, and uh, energetic manipulation and f- additives, preservatives, colorings, flavors, emulsifiers, stabilizers, synthetic foods, synthetic ingredients, uh, you know, neurotoxins. You know, and, and when you consider that only uh, four to six percent of all the food eaten in the world is organic, mm. that means around 94 to 96 percent of everything going in people's mouth is coming by way of five or six major farming conglomerates and a handful of large food processing companies from General Mills to Nestle, etc. And we're already, I mean, Australia, shockingly, is, is, I remember when Australia passed the United States for obesity, I about fell out of my chair when that happened. So we're already seeing all sorts of problems, and COVID turned out to be uh, not a problem for people that were healthy, only people that were already unhealthy. So put on your chef's hat, look into the crystal ball. What's, what do you see in the next three to five or 10 years if we don't make some significant changes to come back into harmony with the planet when we raise and process foods? Yeah. Yeah. Um... We took a, a bit of a deep dive on this in The Magic Pill and we interviewed Alan Savory from the Savory Institute as well as um, Joel Salatin from Polyface Farms. And we also interviewed Leah, Leah Keith who wrote The Vegetarian Myth. And mm, Good. She's a good one. I've listened to that. It's a great book. Yeah, she's she's amazing. I mean, all of these people are amazing. They've all, and interestingly, they've all had their journeys, so to speak, you know. Um, uh, I'd highly encourage people to read The Vegetarian Myth and also uh, understand the work of Alan Savory from the Savory Institute because his story is fascinating. And Joel Salatin, I mean, he's he's so poetic and a beautiful human being. And 
the solutions are there. Again, we do have the solutions at hand. And I I hope and pray that these solutions start to roll out on a grander scale. I mean, I see the narrative that is being pushed through mainstream media at the moment over the last few years about the fake meat, um, the plant the plant based diet and the cows are farting our our way into extinction, so to speak. And you yeah, know, it's just, that leads it's, into my next question. So we'll get into that deeper. It's just ludicrous, and anybody that believes that is is, is misleading. I mean, all you need and to they do call is, this science too. Uh, I, I even had a discussion with somebody two days ago that says, you know, that cows are destroying the the environment. I'm like, have you looked out the window when you're driving through countrysides and how beautiful the the grass is in places like New Zealand and Australia? I said. How on earth could you ever come up with that that correlation that pasture raised animals and pasture fed f- animals and finished animals could ever be destructive to the environment in that in that realm? It just it, it's beyond absurd. It's like that COVID is going to be a pandemic. It's it's beyond absurd. So I believe we have the solutions. I believe there's going to be the destruction of the environment is like the destruction of the human biome at the same time it's the same players it's the same formula it's it's it, you know once you see it that's the same pattern it's the same business model and it's being fed through the mainstream media through their propaganda as as nonsense and bullshit once again pardon the pun but um we do have everything that we need at hand and i honestly believe, and I've said this before, I said, imagine if everyone in Australia just changed the way they ate to what we talked about earlier. I said, the system would change within a year. The agricultural system would change. The medical system would change. The pharmaceutical system would change. The government system would change because of the lobbyists. The mainstream media would change. The multinational food companies would change. Everybody would change if we all as a population, just change the way we eat. So I honestly believe that f- the our relationship to food and how the food is grown or raised or farmed is the key to all of our issues moving forward. And it's that simple. It really is that simple. But to convince or educate a population when the dietary guidelines are still the driving force for information that are, you know, they've been debunked. And I mean, it's, it's criminal, I believe, the the Western dietary guidelines that are in place at the moment. And hopefully class action lawsuits will be the way forward once we get enough people to tackle the Heart Foundation, the Dietitians Associations, the Medical Associations for misleading the public. And that way then I, I when the, as you said earlier, when the Australian Medical Association president came out to challenge us, you said rightly they were concerned about losing money. So when these organisations and industries start to lose money, that's when they'll adapt because that's their driving force. So we do have the solutions, and that's why I'm grateful to have the opportunity to chat to you because however many people listen to this, you actually have the answer in which we can shape this world into a more beautiful experience for everybody and to heal the planet. So that's that's my two cents worth. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm curious. Have you read the book Oneness Versus the 1% by Vandana Shiva? No, but her name has popped up three times, and my wife was actually – uh, taking photos of an article in the New Dawn magazine, which is a wonderful magazine here in Australia, and they did an article on me this this month. And right after us, they've got the article with her about this. So, um, and I just before we hopped on this podcast, I said I need to reach out to her to interview her. So, if you've got a contact, I would love that. Well, I've left messages on a couple websites that she's either created or, or, um, is part of, and I haven't gotten any response. I think she's an extremely busy woman who's probably got little time for 
podcasts, when you study the book Oneness versus the One Percent, you you get a very clear sense that she's very, very engaged in protecting the people of India. But the reason I ask you is because in that book, she does the most thorough job I've ever seen of laying Bill Gates right out on the table, all of his companies, how much money's in them, what their investments are, what their belief is, what their belief in biotechnology, GMO farming, seed manipulation is, how she talks about how they literally have tried to stamp out organic farming and she said they shut down over 400 uh, small producers of organic local oils, uh, such as, you know, cooking oils, and how people just started getting sick like crazy and they would only let you use GMO made oils. And they were literally trying to make it illegal to farm like that. They want everyone buying uh, GMO seeds that you have to get from Monsanto or Bear so that they have you completely hooked. Um, you know, you know the the list goes on. But when you see what she has had to protect the country of India against due to Bill Gates and his various companies, and how they're using the people as guinea pigs, and oh my God, it just I have studied a lot of stuff on Bill Gates, but she does the best job of not only showing how this guy is single handedly creating his own printing press for money and getting everybody else to buy into it and how all these big donations he makes masquerading as a philanthropist are everything but a donation. It's all a trick. He's a world-class con man, this guy. But uh, I was just curious because that book is, I believe, right now, one of the most important books in the world. And she is an expert at soil science and organic and biodynamic farming. And I wish we had a hundred more women like her out there because she really is a true spiritual warrior. And she talks all about Gandhi's philosophy and how she's a student of Gandhi's philosophy and how we can approach this nonviolently and how she's approached it nonviolently and managed to get Bill Gates and a lot of his companies and a lot of the the laws he's paid people to pass shut down and turned over. But uh, anyhow, it's just this this whole thing. You know, if you start looking into Bill Gates's connection to the coronavirus and the pandemic, it's it's shocking. It's sickening. It's it's duly upsetting. And uh, unfortunately, he's you know she she talks about. She lays out the finances. One of this guy's companies, which he has, you know, maybe 20 or 30 people involved with him, is worth $3 trillion and is just making massive amounts of money by convincing people to eat all this crap food and get into all these scams. And, you know, of course, he's the chief pioneer behind mass vaccination and mandatory vaccination and chipping people and. Oh my God, the it just goes on and on and on. And it's just shocking to me how people are so completely asleep and how they believe almost everything they read in the media and don't realize he has actually bought off all the media corporations. He has a team of people working with him. He writes the media scripts for all the TV stations. I don't know. Did you see the Plandemic documentary? Yeah, I did. We've actually just put it up on our Evolve network as of yesterday. The um, Mickey has given us the ability to share that on our platform because we can't be censored. So that's um, yeah. That's I just fantastic. interviewed him. He's a beautiful man, and um, we anybody can watch it for free on our network at EvolveNetwork.tv. That's excellent to know because I haven't had a chance to watch Plandemic Two. Have you got Plandemic Two up there? Oh yes, that's that's the one we've got. Plandemic Two. Okay, yeah. So I watched Plandemic 1 on London Real TV, and uh, in there they clearly showed how he's controlling the narrative and how every TV network around the world is saying the same things verbatim, and it all tracks right back to Bill Gates and his little think tank and how he's brainwashing the world to believe in all this stuff. But again, you know, it's people like Von Donashiva and us and everybody that is aware of what's going on that we can help people get resources like this that actually show enough evidence for us to really see what is his real agenda what is he really up to and i'll tell you what 
I'm a pretty brave guy. I've been a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, a boxer, a kickboxer, a motocross racer, a uh, stock car racer. I've gone through the hells of hell with plant medicines and died and come back to life and everything else. And when I look at what Bill Gates is up to, it is very deeply concerning to me, especially when I, I consider my children's future. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What do you think are some key action items we need to take, take, take action on collectively at this time to avoid potentially disastrous consequences? If you had to narrow it down to two or three things, you'd say, okay, this is what we've all got to work on together. What would it be? Yeah, I think um, community is definitely paramount. Uh, education is what you're doing here and elsewhere, and and solutions. You know, it just keeps coming back to solutions, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm watching the political landscape out out in the world, and you know, there's. There's stuff going on in your country, which is sort of on a knife edge at the moment. And there's um, different theories about that. And yeah, I'm, I have no idea what's coming, but um, I have just been asked recently to enter politics in this country. In I was asked by the, the tribal people of this country, the indigenous, to help represent them. Um, Good. I think you should. Please do it. Which is an unusual request that came through a month or two ago. So um, that's God talking to you, buddy. Mm-hmm. So we'll see where that leads. That um, it's. You know, I'm excited about that prospect. So we'll see. You know, I, I think I think this is a marathon. I don't think it's a sprinter. To be honest with you, I think. Um, I think there's definitely storylines, as you just mentioned, with Bill Gates and the agenda that they do have their intention and narrative that they're playing out. But that, at the same time, you've got your storyline and narrative that you're playing out. I've got mine. Each and every one of us has, their, has our own version of reality that we would like to see come to fruition. So I think if we live in fear of someone like Bill Gates's agenda, I think it, it disempowers us. It, it Just because that is set in motion doesn't mean it will finish that way. It doesn't mean that that storyline will, will, will be true. It just means that that storyline is out there. What are we going to do with our storyline? You know, and that, that's, that's the only place I can get to with all of this is that each and every one of us has a part to play in this. And some of us are warriors, some of us are educators, some of us uh, hold space and, and do the work behind the scenes for ourselves or our families. Some people will put their head in the sand and that's okay. And each and every one of us will go on, on and do what spirit tells us or we will hide from that or run away from that through our own fears. But there will come a time when... It will present itself in one way or another, like you said, whether it be under a surgeon's knife or a relationship breakdown or witnessing a loved one experience some sort of pain or trauma through some sort of inaction. So let's hope what, uh, we don't get to that point. No, let's hope we don't. I'm doing everything I can do to inspire people. I really believe we can handle this non-violently. Um, I just feel that there's a lot of very interesting and sometimes sinister forces at play that are, they seem to be working toward creating a civil war in the United States and creating mayhem. So they have every reason to um, enact a full time on the ground uh, lockdown type situation, which gives them the chance to just take over the economy and buy up everything on pennies in the dollar and they've got a long history of doing this so it's not anything new but it seems like they're perfecting the craft and the good news is is that they're using social media and computer technology to do it and we all have access to social media and computer technology and i think we can use the exact same science and technology that's causing complete 
problems and damage to the world to turn the problem around by just changing our thinking and using the tools to create harmony on the planet instead of destruction. And I think really, that's really all it's going to take is public education, which leads to public awareness, which leads to informed choices. And I think that, you know, we, we don't have an infinite amount of time. If you look at the research on the condition of the planet and the natural systems and resources, we're on a very, very, <laughs> shall we say, we're on thin ice. And that's coming from the most genius minds in the world, people like David Suzuki and many others, you know. So it's not like we can just sit around and eat donuts and watch video games and say someone else is going to figure it out because what we've been seeing with the pandemic is really a clear example of what they're up to and how far they're willing to go to create the reality they want us to experience as opposed to whether or not we want it. It's hard to change your reality when you've got people arresting you for walking on the beach and many other things uh, that have been going on. And, and when we're losing the rights to our own bodies and what we put into them, and we're losing the rights to share our own opinions, which is critical for a democracy to stay healthy, then I think that it's pretty obvious that they're already fairly far along in their agenda. And when you consider how much chemicals and how much risky experimentation they're doing with genetic modification of animals and plants and trying to take seeds out of people's hands and Bill Gates is basically creating a massive seed bank where he's trying to catalog all the seeds on the planet, but then at the same time, trying to force us to buy seeds from his own companies that are genetically modified. This is These are very, very dangerous situations that really border on crimes against humanity as well as crimes against the planet. I mean, when Exxon spills millions of gallons in the oil, we hold them responsible. When they spill millions of gallons of oil in the ocean, we try to hold them responsible and make them clean up their messes, etc. And I think that we are at a point now where we've all got to basically realize that we have to become a force of social justice, which is going to really require a lot of education because you can't really stand up for something that you don't understand, which is why I keep referencing books and experts and people like Zach Bush and, and encouraging people to go to greenmedinfo.com and, you know, the Czech Institute and all sorts of these places because there's a lot of great sources for good information. Price Pottinger Foundation, Weston A. Price Foundation, British Soil Association. Um, there, there's we, we have access to great information. The problem is the people behind this are so filling people's minds with so much crap and distractions. The question is, how do you actually get good information to that many people and inspire them to read it instead of just writing you off as another hippie or nature lover or tree hugger. So I think at some point here, there, it's going to start to get really obvious that we're at a tipping point and we have to act collectively and intelligently or the consequences are going to be uh, something that we can't probably even imagine. I agree, my friend. I agree. Hopefully this podcast has... Um put a little bit of inspiration out there for for the listeners and it's it's um yeah hey i'm inspired it's a wild ride that's for sure it's a wild ride and i've got two little children my son my first son paul jr is 41 and he's about to turn me into a grandpa in january so i'm excited about that but i'm i'm taking it advantage of the fact that I have two beautiful little children. I'm going to raise them to be truly spiritual warriors and to understand earth science and farming. And these kids are going to be able to build and create anything kind of like Ben Greenfield does with his kids. I'm really impressed with how he parents his kids, but uh, Pete, it's getting late. I got to get to dinner and spend a little time with my kids. I promised my son a wrestling match before bed. Where can awesome. people find you find your Product offerings, your videos, your documentaries. I know you mentioned your new site. Can you mention your website and your new media site again, please? Sure. Uh, PeteEvans.com is my website, and we've just launched a new platform called EvolveNetwork.tv. 
uh, I my intention with that is to create one of the larger uh, conscious content platforms for people to be able to access information. So currently we have the first channel, which is my channel on there, because uh, we, we wanted to show what could be done. So we have meal plans on there, recipes, podcasts, vodcast, the two films we've mentioned today, the Bailey Way TV series, and a whole lot more expert interviews and cooking classes and a whole lot more. And in the future, we'll be bringing in other people to have their own channels if they like. Uh, so if anybody that's listening that is in the uh, the health and wellness space that would like to have their own um, channel, please get in contact with me at the evolvenetwork.tv and you can have a look at what we've created. And yeah, so hopefully in the future, we'll have yoga channels on there, other different cooking channels, uh, different spiritual channels and networks. And, and so, so be it. It's a hundred percent uncensored, which is great because I could see what was happening in the, in the environment YouTube uh, deplatforming people, social media companies deplatforming and censoring people. So this is, uh, an, again, another solution that's out there for people to be able to share information. And if they choose to, they can monetize it um, by putting summits on there or courses or whatever they choose to under their own channel. Or they can um, share their content on my channel if they choose to. So that's, um, that's an exciting thing. Again, rolling the dice and seeing that felt like the right thing to do at this particular point in time in history because I was getting censored. And, um, yeah, we'd love to see you on there. And uh, once again, Paul, you are a beautiful human being and it's been a pleasure to be able to spend some time with you once again and hear your words of wisdom and to everybody listening, have a wonderful day and experience in this life and um, express yourself creatively without fear. Yes, I agree. And and by the way, have you seen our chakiva.com site pete i haven't yet but um i tell me more it's c-h-e-k-i-v-a kiva is a pueblo indian place of worship it represents the balance of male and female energies so it's check c-h-e-k i so it's the spiritual place of worship and it's our social media platform where we have video audio uh, articles, uh, basically exactly what you're doing. It's our own private platform. So if you get a chance, have a look. I'd love to also co-share some of your stuff. So if you go to chakiva.com, if you find some things you'd like um, on yours, let me know. I thought I'd mention to you, are you familiar with the series, the podcast series I did? I think it's five parts. I did it with Matt Walden, my senior instructor called The Honest Vegetarian. Yes, I am. Okay, great. Because uh, I thought if you hadn't listened to that, you'd find that fascinating because we go quite deep into all these different things. So uh, lovely to have you here, Pete. Thank you for everything that you're doing in the world. Thank you for being so beautiful and gracious with all the challenges and the social uh, you know, disrespect being generated by people that have ulterior motives. But uh, I think anybody listening to this podcast can easily tell you're not a neo-Nazi or uh, a racist or any of that stuff. So hopefully uh, more exposure like this will will only highlight the fact that people that are really doing their best for the world are being manipulated, suppressed, and lied about. And uh, that's what we've all got to work together to clear up. So as more of us become aware, we have options, and it certainly gives us lots to do so that uh, we've all got a healthier future and we come back into harmony with the planet. So thanks for all the great work you're doing, Pete, and uh, lots of love, and, and let's uh, get together and help each other any way we can. Thank you, my brother. I love you and I love everybody. So thank you for listening and have a wonderful day or night wherever you are around the world. And thank you to all the uh, podcast listeners. Thank you for sharing the episodes and thank you to the sponsors for your amazing and beautiful products. And thank you to all of you for any of you that buy anything from the sponsors of Living 4D with Paul Check, because every time you do, uh, you're supporting me and having the time and the ability to produce the podcast, which does take a lot of my time. And there's a whole team of us involved. So you're not only putting money in the hands of people that are caring for the planet and using organic and biodynamic farming methods, but they're doing their best to make truly healthy foods and uh, supplements and supports for all of us to live well. So lots of love, everybody. 
thanks for joining us today and hope you enjoy exploring Pete Evans's uh, Evolve Network TV and website. He's got a lot of great stuff. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Pete Evans. You can find more about Pete on his EvolveNetwork.tv website or connect with him via Instagram and Telegram at Chef Pete Evans. His Facebook page is The Evolve Network Pete Evans. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living 4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living 4D with Paul Check. Remember, you can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's new streaming media site, chikiva.com.